Hello, dear participants. We are delighted to welcome you today to the project Contested Modernities, Post-Colonial Architecture in Southeast Asia, which is a part of the long-term project Encounters with Southeast Asian Modernism. My name is Edward Kögel. I'm a member of the team of initiators and curators who are your hosts today. And I'm speaking on their behalf here as well. My curatorial partners are Sally Bello, Moritz Henning, and Christian Hiller. Today, Shirley Surya from M Plus in Hong Kong will lead through our symposium in a moment. We are very happy that Shirley found the time since her own institution M Plus soon will open for the public. And as everybody knows, this also involves a lot of work. Before I go into more detail about the project, a few organizational things. We do have a technical director for this Zoom conference, Erwin Wilms, who will make sure that everything runs smoothly and if necessary, will mute open microphones. Please check and mute your microphone yourself. During the symposium, the chat function will be active so if you have questions or comments that we can discuss, feel free to post them. Our moderator will later talk with all the contributors and bring in your input. If you would like to contribute to the conversation later, please use the raise your hand function. You will find it in the bottom right corner under the word reaction. Beyond this Zoom event, the magazine Arch Plus is streaming us live on Facebook too. But now to the content. We are discussing post-colonial modernism, which stands for a symbolic new beginning in architecture and urban planning in the respective countries. The local modernities from Southeast Asia were created based on an understanding of cultural peculiarities and the climatic requirements of building in tropical regions. This period of architectural modernism from 1940s to the 1970s is largely unknown in Europe. In the region itself, however, an intensive discourse has developed over recent years. We are interested in the modernist narratives in Southeast Asia and the local way of dealing with the history, present and future of buildings and urban spaces. This includes the discourse about the hoped for effect during the construction period and the significance of the buildings today, but also the actors who deal with this topic today. Since both Germanys were also looking for a symbolic new beginning after World War II, the discussions about how to deal with the building fabric from this time are quite similar. In August 2019, our encounters started with a real event a symposium in Berlin. At that time, many experts from Asia, from Asia shed light on the modernity of their countries and gave us an initial insight into the issue from their perspective. In October and November 2019, our curatorial partners presented exhibitions, city tours, events, and workshops in Phnom Penh, Yangon, Jakarta, and Singapore. We had the great pleasure of being there and we learned a lot. After the event in Asia, our goal was to bring back this insight to Berlin and to open the exhibition Contested Modernities in the House of Statistics last year. The pandemic has caused delays. Last Friday, we were finally able to open the exhibition even if our curators from the four cities could not be there. We all hope that we will find an opportunity to see one or the other again in the near future. The exhibition that has now opened in Berlin is based on the exhibitions in the four named cities, and we added the aspect of the architectural transfer from the two German states to Southeast Asia from the 1950s onwards. The exhibition will stay open until October 24th. And last but not least, the English issue of the magazine Art Plus, entitled Contested Modernities, has been published on the occasion of the opening of the exhibition. In addition to the exhibition, the website and the publication we, ho we host for online symposia. Today we present the third with 
the title, The Future of Modernity. Before we start, I would like to thank on behalf of the curatorial team, the Capital Cultural Fund and the Federal Ministry of the Interior for Construction and Community for their funding of the overall project. Thank you very much. And as part of the project and with the help of some further supporters, we were able to realize new works such as video productions in Jakarta and Singapore, which can now be found on our website. Our thanks go to Berlin Senate Department of Urban Development and Housing, the governing mayor of Berlin Senate Cancellery, Goethe Institutes in Jakarta, Yangon and Singapore, the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany in Singapore, the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia in Berlin, the Embassy of the Republic of Singapore in Berlin, the National University of Singapore, the Department of Architecture, Art Plus Magazine, Stadtkultur International e.V., House of Statistics in Berlin. But now let me introduce our moderator, Shirley Surya, who will guide us to this symposium today. Shirley is curator in design and architecture at M Plus, Hong Kong's new Museum of Visual Culture. She has contributed to shaping M Plus permanent collection through her research and acquisitions of works that engage with plural modernities as well as transnational and interdisciplinary knowledge networks in Greater China and Southeast Asia. At M Plus, she co curated the exhibitions in search of Southeast Asia through the M Plus collection in 2018, Mobile M Plus Neon Science Hong Kong in 2014, and Building M Plus, the Museum and Architecture Collection in 2014. Outside M Plus, she made curatorial contributions to incom incomplete urbanism, uh, attempts of critical spatial practice at the NTU uh, Center of Contemporary Art in Singapore in 2016, and Jung Ho Chang, Fei Chang, Tianzu Materialism at the Allen Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing in 2012. She received her Bachelor in Media Studies at the University of California in Berkeley and a Master in History of Design from the Royal College of Art in London. Shirley, now it's your turn. Uh, I just, oh, am I? Yes, you can hear me. Thank you, uh, Edward, uh, for the full on introduction according to the bio, but I didn't expect that, but thank you. And I just want to thank you as well as the team for inviting me uh, in, into this discussion because I, I am so looking forward to really learning from all of you because this topic, um, I think this topic, it's, I'm just so glad that you actually organized the, the topic of the future of modernity after having discussed the concepts and the histories behind post-colonial architecture, because I think the real task right now is really how do you actually keep the reality or the physicality of these buildings that had meant so much uh, when they were uh, manifested in, in the, in the, in the post-war period. Uh, and so I'm just really excited to hear that, that, um, that you've not, you've, you, I mean, your team had come and pulled together um, not only a topic that is timely and pertinent, uh, but it's also examples of case studies that are from very diverse geographies. And that's a really important, uh, I think, a transnational discussion from Singapore, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, even, and, and, uh, and what's happening in Germany as well. And also very diverse strategies and the people who really are able to address how this, this form of preservation and activism can come from a either a kind of like a local governmental policy, grassroots kind of like activism, or even a kind of international coalition that Johannes is part of, or even this privately funded kind of a successful model of conservation. And so I'm just excited to hear this multifaceted way of looking at, um, uh, I guess, conservation of modern architecture. So I shall not say too much, but really welcome our first speaker, uh, Johannes Vidodo. Um, and his bio obviously is a uh, three paragraphs long. I shall not say it all. But just say the main, the main thing about what he'll be sharing with us is really about uh, what he has done in all these different uh, organizations. Uh, uh, and first of all, Johannes is a director of the graduate programs in architectural conservation, which actually is a, a very new program. This got set up at the Department of Architecture National University of Singapore. But apart from that, uh, what he's been doing for almost more than a decade uh, was that he was a founding executive of MAAN, MAN, which is Modern Asian Architecture Network. And he's also a very key uh, member, founding director of Dokomomo Macau, who has Dokomomo Singapore, and advisory board member 
of the Preservation of Sites and Monuments of the National Heritage Board of Singapore. So these are, these are just come some of the key, I think, key roles that Johannes had played uh, in really shaping uh, what's going on uh, in Southeast Asia, but also in Singapore in general. And what he'll be sharing with us is really the strategies that have been kind of taken on, or perhaps even the tactics um, through these different uh, agencies. And so we really welcome um, Johannes to be able to start sharing your presentation. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, let me just start with the presentations because we have to move very fast. You only have 20 minutes, right? So, okay. <laughs> Okay, let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. All right. So, so thank you for very generous introductions. Well, when somebody asks uh, about my CV, just simple say, simply say, just Google. Now everything <laughs> is easy. It's no secret. Well, what I want to say in this next twenty minutes, uh, if I can, is it's a story. Actually, it's not a very serious thing. Uh, it's 8 p.m. in Singapore now, 8.20. So I have my beer here. So, but I just want to tell you about the, the, what happened 20 years ago. Actually, it's 21st, 21 years ago when a group of, uh, of us actually is, uh, went to a, a conference of China Modern Architecture in Guangzhou, in China. And during that time, we are talking about textbook that has been used by our student in Asia. And we realized that actually the book by Bannister Fletcher, the, the history of architecture has become one of the, 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 say like a Bible of architecture. And they say, do we have a, our own uh, book in architecture or modern architecture? We say we don't have. Of course, there is some Chinese versions, there is some Indonesian version here and there, but we don't have the English versions. So that's the first realization step. Well, let's start to do something. And the problem is language because we have Japanese, we have Indonesians, we have Chinese, we have Indian, we have uh, Thais, and all these people doesn't speak English. Well, we, we, I speak English, uh, the Chinese is even worse. So we say, well, we declare that our language will be broken English. We don't want to be this Queen English, but it's also a, a sign of uh, a pride that she say, okay, we are not ashamed to our own uh, uh, legacy. So we start with this kind of networking uh, based on the model of a Chinese dining table. It's a round table that people can just sit and it's a dim sum table. So it's, it's conversations among friends. So we don't set up um, a formal organization and we call that MAAN with small m because we want to challenge the big M. And even in the later stage, actually, we also reduce the A into a small A. Because we also, well, we are not talking about iconic architecture. We're not talking about modernist uh, iconic architecture, but we are talking about the ordinary architecture. So as we move very fast. So almost every year, we are organizing a conference in different cities. Macau 2001, Singapore 2002, Surabaya, Indonesia 2003, then in Shanghai, Istanbul, Tokyo, and then Delhi, back to Singapore, Bhopal, and finally Seoul. So it's a very long, about, 11 years. The first 11 years is actually we are exploring the extremities of Asia from east to west, north and south. And besides um, conferences, we also doing uh, workshops, student workshop. We do uh, infantry, comprehensive infantry in different cities from Ulaanbaatar to Kuala Lumpur to Melaka to Bogor, everywhere. So we are doing like a, like a sampling and acupuncturing. And we are trying to, to see, to, to understand ourselves, what, what is this, the so-called the Asian modernity in Asian modernism? Why our shop houses cannot be categorized in Dokomomo Fitch? Well, why the Dokomomo uh, standard has to be implemented to us? And if we implemented the Dokomomo uh, uh, standard, then none of our architecture actually qualified as a modern architecture. So we're not happy with that, but we have to substantiate our unhappiness. So therefore, the, 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 the comprehensive inventory is important. And especially we are using, not using, we are engaging the students. We work with universities. We use research money from universities to do all these things. And then we publish those in books, like a workshop in Shanghai or a maps in Jakarta, and also in Malacca in Palembang and different cities as well. So the next step is, of course, is we are trying to look for seminal writings. 
So one of our member, uh, Nakatani uh, in Japan, and also Yasushi Zeno in Jakansha in India, edited a first, the first uh, series of modern architecture from Asia. And it's called Jewels, and it's a private publication paid by uh, Nakatani uh, research money in, in Japan. But the content is a translation of the locally seminal uh, articles uh, on, on, on modernity and modernity from Japan, from China, from India, from Cambodia, and all these things. And then the second article is actually is a reflection essay from our perspectives. So this is one of the very important steps towards the so-called the, the trying the, 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 the theorizations of modern architecture. And so far we have three declarations of man. First is the Man Macau Declaration 2001 when we are saying that basically we are a layered modernity. Asian modernity is a hybrid modernity. Our modernity is not pure, but it's also a result of layering process of colonization, decolonization, nation building, industrialization, name it. So everything's happened and this has become uh, our identity. And then we come to Istanbul in 2005. So every five years, we are trying to reflect so journey and reflections, what is uh, been achieved? Because Istanbul is at the end of Asia, so-called Asia. And actually the Roman call Asia as is, 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 is Turkey, not beyond that. So that's why it's very important and symbolic when we produce this man Istanbul declarations to reinstate what is our belief and what we have get, uh, trying to, to achieve during that period. And, 2011, we come to Seoul, and in Seoul, we start talking about the difficult heritage. That actually, the so-called industrial heritage is not just black and white, it's not the simply functionalism, but it's loaded with a lot of things, ideology, imperialism, oppressions. Uh, railroad is just a railroad for, for transportation, but it's also exploitation of our resources to Europe, for example, or also, um, uh, the, 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 the time when the Japanese built the, the railroad in Manchuria is also something to do with, with oppressions, something to do with, uh, with blood and sweat. So we say that our industrial heritage also not just simply uh, tools for modernism. It's not just simply uh, about technology, but it's loaded with uh, different cases. And there is a lot of difficult things if you are talking about the cross-border transnational kind of modernism. So this declaration actually is partly is, uh, is trying to reflect about the definitions and understanding. And then in 2010, uh, I make the first report into the, in the in architectural education because on the educational front, we also want to influence the architecture school, especially in Asia, to start looking into the local uh, materials start looking into the discourse of the, the localities and using our inventory as one of the basis for, for, for developing the modern architecture modules in, in different uh, universities in, in, in Asia and Southeast Asia. So there is a brief stop uh, after 2011. Uh, we are getting tired. Most of us are very old and running like sprint run for 11 years is not easy because every year at least we have to organize one international seminar and two uh, comprehensive workshops in different parts of Asia. So we feel that, okay, it's time to retire. Actually, we, are, we want to pass this to the next generations, but grant is depleted. We don't have money, we don't have resources. So what happened in 2015, the, in Japan, there's a lot of iconic buildings from 1960s and 70s to be demolished. And Dokomomo Japan actually is looking into uh, partnerships to convince the Japanese government and the Japanese community that they should stop uh, the demolition of modern heritage of the 60s. So one way is that they, are, they ask us to, to show some good cases from Southeast Asia. And then we formulated this new uh, so-called uh, to renew the, the movement they call it Maseana because we focus on ASEAN countries with small M again and small A again because we are continuation of the MAAN uh, workshops. And then we are thinking about this opportunity as a launching pad for the younger generations, those under 40 years old. And I draw this uh, concepts of a launching pad 
like a reverse pyramid where all these supporters like Japan Foundation, Toyota Foundation, what the sponsor the money is on the left is uh, supporting the, the reverse pyramid. On, and the other side is organizations like uh, like uh, Dokomomo, like uh, Iman, e-commerce 20th century, uh, civil societies, whatever is at the bottom. And three of us, myself, Yamana and, uh, and Sin, is become the servants. We are the servants of the younger chaps uh, from 10 ASEAN countries to, to do something. And we provide with money, we provide with connections and so on to start the another round of inventory. And the result is being published in online. So you, you go to the website, you can download all of this. And we are going around five Asian countries, but in each Asian country, in each conference, then we, we have at least two presentations of two workshops. So it covers 10 Asian countries. And the second conference is in Japan because we want to convince uh, the Japanese that yeah, Asia can do this, why not Japanese? So the Japan using us, we are using the Japanese. So this is the way that we, we are trying to, to combine this uh, synergy of uh, similar needs. So 2016, we talked uh, about Catalyst, the pioneers of modern Asian architecture in Hanoi. And then 2011 and 2017, we talked about social agenda, uh, about housing, about living in Southeast Asia, modern living in Jakarta. And then in Bangkok 2018, we are focusing on materiality, technology. It's not just concrete, but not reinforce concrete with steel, but for example, like concrete reinforced with bamboo. There's a lot of innovation as well in Southeast Asia regarding this materiality. And then 2019, we are talking about environment, about the topography of modern movement, climate locality, modern architecture and monsoon in Asia in Tokyo. We start talking about the relations to 17 SDG and climate change and how the importance of, 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 of conservation of modern heritage. And Finally, and then in, in Singapore, we are doing this uh, conference talking about the economic viability. And the title is Progressive Once More, Rejuvenating Mid-Century Modern Architecture in Southeast Asia. So this is basically is the, 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 the culmination of this uh, first stage of the Masiana project. And we start looking into the reality now. We, start, we are trying to do some conserv real conservations. Uh, but in the meantime, we also engaging Dokomomo, trying to change the mindset of Dokomomo from total Eurocentrism into something that is more you know, hybrid and more open towards this. And the result is after the meeting in Chandigarh in 2003, Dokomomo uh, published a special edition on modern uh, modernism in Asia Pacific for the first time. And, and this is uh, edited by uh, Sheridan Burke from Australia, from uh, the, the e-commerce 20th century. Uh, and then Dokomomo published this with some uh, seminar articles about Southeast Asia. And then and this is under Maristela Cassiato at that time. So when the Anna Tostos become the president of Dokomomo, we restart again the engagement. And by inviting her to come to Tokyo as a uh, uh, visiting professors at Tokyo University, but at the same time also give it opportunity to go around Southeast Asia, to Macau, to Singapore, to different places, to Taiwan and so on. And then when I organized a conference um, uh, and, and after that, uh, the engagement, actually they come up with this publication of modern Southeast Asia editions uh, in 2017. And then once again, I invited her to come to, to to, to Brisbane in 2020, when we organized another conference, it's nothing to do with Asian modernity, but it's something to do with uh, International Network of Tropical Architecture. This is also an initiative by uh, NUS. So we start talking about this, the tropical belt, how this modernism actually is not just talking about Asia, not just about Europe, but also the entire world and following the tropicality. And the tropical belt actually is very important catalyst for this, uh, development of different variations across the world. So the next, uh, the, the Dokomomo Journal 63, February 2020 is talking about this tropical modern architecture diaspora. And finally come into Singapore, the result, the impact of that Masiana conference in Singapore and the publication of that blue book where we invited the Minister of National Development as the keynote speaker. 
because MND is a very, very key person in terms of regulations and role about the about conservations. And then we organized the conference in URA, the, the Urban Redevelopment Authority. So basically we post the words about the importance of conserving modern architecture and look, put it in the perspective of, of, of sustainability, which is in line with Singapore plan for the Green Plan 2030, is one of the very important strategy to change the mindset, but also the policies in Singapore. We just lost one iconic building, um, the, the Pearl Bank apartment. And soon the minister and also the, the, the urban development authority saying that, well, maybe we can try something because there's so many noises that we created in this tiny island, but conserving other. And then we take this building, the, the, the Golden Mile, as another brutalist building, as one of the experiments of this, uh, where they can save this. And we're not just doing this uh, through the, the conference, but we also um, doing a very active public engagement. And Singapore Heritage Society, for example, where Ron normally is just looking into fragile issue of heritage society, now getting interested into taking these issues of modernism and doing some exhibition and all. And the academic side, some of the students at NUS take this as a final project uh, you know, design. And we use this in the, in, the, in the exhibitions to create more interest to this, especially to the developers, that we can show them it's possible to keep this building relevant, building and keep the, the, uh, the, the, the structure, but at the same time also generating the, the so-called economic viability on this. And finally, uh, after creating this and attracting the, the, uh, the attentions on the, on, the, on the press, URA actually finally uh, changed the rules and decided to conserve this building and give an incentive to the developer, the private developer, uh, another site next to this building as a, like a transfer of development right to the next site. But at the same time, also they asked the developer to, to keep the building. But this is not happening yet, but it's still waiting because of the crisis. But we are start to have this confidence that, well, no, it's not just about discourse, it's not just about theory, but it's also possible to do a conservation. So, and then of course, because of thanks to, to this and 100 years of Bauhaus, uh, this uh, the discussions getting more exciting because it's, it's not just about the, the publication and whatever, but we are trying to come to Europe now. We are trying to go to Europe and say something to Europeans about our discourse. So we feel that we have enough confidence that we are in the same level now. So it's not just like this in the, in the past, but we are at the same level because we have something to tell the world about us. And our younger generations, like Chang Jia Tui published different books um, uh, about tropical architecture, about non-West modern in past, and then another groups of us, uh, young uh, scholars, Jia Tui and Tajuddin Imran, plus some writers, uh, compiles uh, Southeast Asia modern architecture. So there's a more and more book has been published uh, in the last, uh, say, uh, five years. And I think this is a very uh, encouraging sign that the discourse is very healthy. Uh, it's not just uh, in uh, Singapore, but also in, in, in Thailand and in, in Cambodia, in Malaysia, even in Indonesia. This uh, attempt to, to regenerate, not just about conservation, but or not just about the, the inventory or just theoretical discourse, but publications to provide books, to provide textbook uh, with a very different perspective from the Eurocentric perspective to our local perspective has been very fruitful. And the latest book that will come out maybe very soon in one or two months is the compilations of the, the result of the Matsiana uh, projects, 2015-2020. Uh, and then moving forward, we will continue to do this comprehensive inventory intensive, uh, uh, intensive discourse, workshop, capacity building, conference, publication, whatever, and uh, any opportunity to arise from here. And then we start to expand the networking and strategic coalitions with the Komomo, with e-commerce 20th century, UNESCO World Heritage, UNESCO Asia Pacific, ICROM, TICHI, uh, KETI Conservation Institute, uh, 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 
the Climate Heritage Network, International Network of Tropical Architecture, SEACHA, a Southeast Asian Architecture uh, Conservation uh, Cultural Heritage Alliance, Asian Academy of Heritage Management, and so on, to, to post this forward into a wider net. And then most importantly is thinking about regeneration and continuations into MAN2 that probably uh, it will come with, uh, with a new projects to, to, to continue the discourse. And I think the most important step that I'm proud of is the, the, the opening of the new uh, graduate programs in architectural conservation and then US since last January that focus completely into the modern heritage and how this modern heritage can be uh, adaptively reused can be appreciated as part of the, the, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals and so on. And of course, the big uh, events come now, then we have this opportunity to, to make these reflections at this very interesting meeting. So thank you. Thank so you, it's Hannes. 20 years story of 20 years uh, in 20 minutes. I know 20 years and and all the fruits that you just you know the food from all these discourse and all these attempts of the older guys no don't worry about it you're still as useful as ever <laughs> and just a lot of energy and I think yeah I think as I mean coming from our our perspective as a uh, M plus we, we we derive a lot of benefit from all these research and because really like what you said all these inventory means a lot you know just having a kind of a wider set of references beyond what has already been published by the official canon of a very eurocentric or american centric kind of examples of modern architecture or even rethinking what modern is so i'm just yeah very much uh, benefiting from all these discourse that you guys created so we go to the next speaker uh, oliver elser uh, will be our next one and he will be of course talking a lot about um what he's often talked about but i'm sure um SOS brutalism has uh, really has more impact uh, ever since it was first exhibited and published um, in, um, I think it was like 20, 2016, 20, oh my goodness, like there was, uh, I forgot which year it was, but it's been a few years, but it's been really gaining traction uh, everywhere across the globe, uh, just as, as you have already kind of like aspired it to be a global discourse of, of what brutalism is. And I'm sure right now with the different kinds of camps um, that are supporting uh, brutalism, um, I think you're also, uh, I'm sure, redefining and, and rethinking what that, that term actually means and how it's possibly something like what the word that Johannes used was hybridized, I guess, what, what brutalism actually is about and how it manifests in different cultural cultural political economic context. So uh, so that's the project that you'll be, uh, you'll be uh, introducing more. And um, so again, I think Oliver needs a little introduction. He's the curator of uh, the German Architecture Museum and uh, uh, in Frankfurt, and he has curated many exhibitions, especially the one that I was completely impressed by, uh, Making Heimat uh, at uh, Venice Biennale in 2016, as well as uh, not just about uh, on brutalism, but a very important exhibition on postmodernism as well as architectural models in the 20th century uh, and Simon Ungers uh, all at DEM and many other publications that he's done. So let you start, uh, Oliver, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Shirley. Can you hear me? I guess uh, everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, thanks um, for the invitation to, uh, to this afternoon and for this kind of introduction. Um, what you see here is the key visual we used for posters and invitations for our show. I have chosen this somehow dramatic background image by the Belgian artist Philippe Dujardin as a starting point for two reasons. Reason one, um, there has been a discussion ever since if brutalism is at all an appropriate term. Um, in the ears of many, it seems to sound too harsh. There is too much brutality involved. Um, so we always ask ourselves, shouldn't we sail under a nicer name? Um, for instance, in Germany, there was an initiative um, about the preservation of 60s and 70s buildings that came up with the title of Big Beautiful Buildings. Um, no, we said we want to stay with brutalism. Um, but there is a second concern about brutalism because brutalism as a part of the modernization process. Um, so why should we distinct brutalist buildings from other modern approaches of the same time? Isn't modernity clear enough? My answer to these concerns is uh, in just one sentence, 
Um, I was want to argue that the aggressiveness um, or bloody mindedness of the use of brutalism and the monster term fulfills a certain task um, since we started the project in 2015. And I will try to elaborate it in this lecture. And the second reason for this image, and then I come to other images, um, has to do with the confusion um, that is intended. Uh, because some of you in the Zoom audience might have wondered which building you see here in this Hollywood film poster style depicted. I have to say, no, that's not a real building. And yes, it's a kind of Frankenstein monster built from ingredients from all over the world. We used it as a poster image to support our argument that brutalism is a worldwide movement, almost independent from the world's different political regimes. It happened everywhere despite all the Cold War separation. So I'll come to the next image, now it should work. Yeah. Um, in this lecture, I want to show how SOS brutalism has evolved over the last six years. These GIFs are from the last venue of our exhibition. The fantastic team from Taipei took the idea of the monster buildings quite literally, and they transformed it into pure cuteness. Um, the venue of the show was a privately owned exhibition space, kind of Kunsthalle for both art and architecture exhibitions. Students from six Taiwanese universities, they did an amazing job. They created a second edition of those cardboard monsters that had been standing in the center of our first exhibition in the dam already in 2017. And here you see the Boston City Hall. Every venue of SOS Brutalism connects to a local community of scholars and activists. Um, in Taiwan, uh, Professor Wang was the co-curator. Six projects from Taiwan were added. And uh, one of those was the Wave Tower, a truly unique school architecture um, that has waving floors because that provides a better site for the children in the classrooms. Also, the temple on top of the staircase is done in concrete. And this is quite remarkable and we'll come to this kind of wood to concrete transformation in the next image. But uh, here on the right, you also see um, our proposals for some key visuals and it finally turned out to be uh, the right poster um, that they, that, that uh, was used. Um, and um, yes, the idea of a transformation of wood into concrete is one of the, at least for me, was most striking ideas of brutalist architecture. And it could be um, really found everywhere in the world. With a closer look, you can discover that the cantilevered concrete beams of this museum that was demolished already, it was standing in Frankfurt, um, that these uh, cantilevered beams that, that bear the white of the uh, facade um, are a transformation from wood taken directly from the opposite. So it's a kind of, it looks pretty brutal, but it's, um, in fact, it's quite contextual. And it took those kind of elements from the opposite building, which was a sole survivor of the World War II bombings in the center of Frankfurt. The idea of melting modernity, concrete, and tradition in form of wood craftsmanship of carpenters, um, I would say it goes back to, um, to, to some project, but especially to, uh, to one project by Kenzo Tango, which you see here. Um, I would say it's one of the most influential ideas in the architecture of the second half of the 20th century. And um, this wood to concrete transformation is um, in a way a re-evaluation of the so-called Stoffwechsel theory um, of Gottfried Semper, a German architect from the 19th century. And it could be found all over the world in the moment, in the very special moment when new traditions, and I would say that's the reason for this transformation, in the very moment when new traditions were needed, like here in the founding process of a new university for Chinese speaking students in Hong Kong. Um, here again, Kenzo Tange, Sacred Heart High School for Girls. Um, it's a more textbook kind of a brutalist building. 
hand here, you see a screenshot from the website of SRS Brutalism, where we always add new insights from the exhibition um, all over the world. And um, as I already said, it's a kind of textbook example uh, type of structure, I would call a brutalist fortress. And so the staircases as defense towers um, could be found here also um, on a Hong Kong campus. Uh, that third project from Taiwan um, was somehow a bit hard to include. Um, the co-curator, Professor Wang, was first hesitating to take it into the show. Um, and in the catalog, he left no doubt that this is a kind of nationalist design, as you see here in the quote. But on the other side, I could convince the team finally to include it. And I see it as one of the temple type projects like the university building from Malaysia, you see here on the bottom, or um, uh, which reflects um, at the same moment the climatic condition, conditions of the tropical situation with uh, heavy rainfalls and at the same moment um, reflects also this kind of line of tradition that goes um, back, I would say, to uh, the Le Corbusier building of La Tourette and the Boston City Hall with its top heaviness and this temple-like cornice motif. So we already have seen three types of brutalist attitudes and I just want to ask you as the audience if we see attitudes or do we see styles? Uh, what do we see exactly when we speak about these buildings? Um, by the definition of Rainer Banham, um, brutalism introduced three new ideas into the world of architecture. It's their memorability as an image, the clear expression of structure and the use of materials as found. And what we did in 2017, we added a fourth um, idea that is what we called rhetoric. So a brutalist building has a certain kind of rhetoric included. Um, but it was not our goal or prime goal uh, to expand Rain and Banham. Um, we started as well as brutalism as a, to support rescue campaigns for endangered buildings all over the world. And so we created an online database with a red list of projects threatened by demolition. Um, but a red list alone wouldn't be sufficient, we thought. We wanted to give an overview of brutalist architecture with a worldwide scope. This map is part of our database and website. And we also started a social media campaign with daily postings on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And um, how you can you can you can you measure these kind of social media activities? We we try to measure it if we, for instance, we count um, the use of this hashtag SOS brutalism on Instagram, and you see that there are um, thirty five thousand postings in general, and um, only one thousand five hundred are made by us. So about um, thirty three thousand people took the term, um, and we always intended. Uh, to be taken as a tool and they used it for their purpose and they used it to mark um, brutalist buildings in danger um, from their uh, local communities. Um, yeah, uh, as in another, another starting point for us was the demolition of brutalist architecture um, right in our hometown in the city of Frankfurt. And um, so we created from all the collected materials through the database and the social media um, activities, finally an exhibition uh, in our museum in Frankfurt. And it, uh, the exhibition started with some monsters that have been turned into real concrete and somehow cute objects. And um, we worked together with German students to create the concrete casts. In the main hall, there were cardboard monsters. And the show was arranged as a journey around the world, jumping from one continent to the next. We wanted to reveal the political, social, economical situations behind the rise of concrete brutalism. Um, every continent or region has a different story. Also, the buildings were sometimes so amazingly similar. The monsters in our museum again some proud students from the Technical University of Kaiserslautern and some concrete models flooding the offices of the two professors involved. Some critical statements concerning concrete architecture from a leading German news magazine from the 1960s and 70s 
were put on the wall. It shouldn't be just cute, but also thought provoking material. This man is sitting under a row of postcards and we presented these postcards to show that this architecture was considered as attractive when it was finished. So postcards were produced. And so people wrote their families and friends about the pretty new uh, modern towns they were visiting and they were traveling to. And we also included a bottle of perfume you see here hanging on the wall. Um, it's called Concrete by Comme des Garçons, a Japanese brand. And it was released shortly before our exhibition opened. We used this perfume to, as an example, to for the increasing importance of concrete in various fields of popular culture, from Prada advertisements to flower pots to music videos like this one from Dua Lipa, made at the Barbican Center. Toilets in a Swiss chalet, the ruins of concrete as a lamp. The exhibition had its funny parts um, accessible for a wider audience. And in fact, it was one of the most successful exhibitions in our museum with about um, 47,000 visitors in four months. The catalog included a variety of scholars from all over the world. And we asked correspondents or local experts. We wanted to write a second volume as an addition to Benham's famous book from 19. 66. So we started it closely, content and design wide, wise, and that was our answer. Um, and we somehow kind of took, took up the idea that it's not necessary to create something new when something great has already been done. And so we really were very close also in terms of graphic design to the Ben Handbook. Um, many people asked us what was the impact of the exhibition? And I like to answer that every venue the, the exhibition went to um, had its own goals, its own agenda of activism or research. In Austria, for instance, some great buildings were already lost. And you see here a tower by Karl Schwanzer standing um, in the center of the Venice show and it's already gone. And so this points to the fact that that was demolished. Um, but others are not um, we're not completely lost, but we're in the process of destructing them. And so we used the public awareness during the show um, in Vienna to fight for those endangered buildings. Um, and uh, in that case, it was uh, Johann Gallis as a local activist. And um, um, our exhibition somehow gave these activities uh, the attention and the platform to fight uh, to keep this cultural center of Mattersburg. You see it on the, on the top is its original shape and on the bottom you see um, how much of it is left um, according to the plans of the architects. Um, the same uh, agenda uh, of, of kind of the need for activism and to, to need to act up uh, was uh, in, in, in Bochum. Um, at the, U, the Ruhr University is one of the greatest biggest, largest examples of brutalism, uh, at least in Germany. And the uni university invited us to come there because they had their own agenda. Um, the high rises uh, of the university you see on the, on the bottom with this kind of red list mark, um, they are so important, um, but they are on the red list. In fact, um, three of them um, will be replaced one after another because of some um, pollution issues. Uh, they use uh, dangerous or considered as dangerous chemicals while they build the buildings. And so they replace one after another and the result is not a good one. Um, and we presented the show in the, in the very heart of the university, in the university theater or art center, uh, what is also on the demolition list. For the announcement of the show, we hijacked um, the arrow from the historical signage system uh, placing neon posters all over the campus. And um, basically it's the same strategy from the catalog, it's appropriation um, by uh, appreciation and appropriation um, of historical strategies. In Aalen, a city near Stuttgart, uh, the city mayor wanted us 
uh, wanted to use our show as an, as an argument to renovate the city hall instead of building a new one. Among the people of Arlen, their city hall is not very popular. Many has, have asked um, if it's not better to destroy that ugly piece. And we tried, uh, with our show, we tried to convince them that their own that, that they own in Arlen something that is quite similar to a building in Japan, which adds some international flavor to their small town. So we created these collages promotional material, melting Kensotange, melting Boston City Hall with the City Hall of Arlen. And the graphic designers, as always, are Galvez and Pietz from Frankfurt. Um, so 2020, in the first year of the pandemic, um, the survey on Taiwan was published by our partners. And I could finish my impressions on Hong Kong brutalism in a piece for the M plus website. Um, we have the support by the Wissenroth Foundation to continue to work until the end of 2022. And now we ask ourselves what might be next. Um, I'm curious, curious about, to hear about your reaction, um, whether it's a good idea to start a new campaign dedicated to what is usually considered to come, next, to come after brutalism. So shall we start SOS POMO maybe? Or should we end with the notion of styles um, at all? And to start a kind of SOS architecture project, every case is different. I'm really looking forward to discuss these issues with you and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Oliver. I am just so excited. <laughs> yeah, just to even hear how your project have evolved since 2016, 2017. And like the amazing strategy you used, you know, to actually use the exhibition as a in a site that is about to be demolished as an as an as a role as a as an agent of advocacy, you know. So I think I'm just excited and SOS Pomo sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and I just wanted to say also very encouraged and also very challenged. Uh, I think uh, I think SOS brutalism was really a, a model for museums to really consider uh, what could their role be in something that is much more activist uh, and as opposed to just completely this historical discourse only. So I think, uh, and also just how global that you really attempted just through social media and the power of the hashtag. And so I think it's just an amazing model for all of us. So thank you. So the next speaker we are bringing is Momo Lewin. And I hope I said your name rightly, Momo. Um, just wanted to say that our hearts are still for um, for Myanmar, and I just wanted to thank you again for really making it into this uh, talk with us. Um, so just wanted to share that uh, what Momo will be sharing will be uh, uh, based on her role, a very important role, uh, as a director of the Yangon Heritage Trust in, in Yangon, of course. And, um, and she has been that uh, founding director since 2012. And the Trust is an independent nonprofit organization. Uh, it advocates for urban heritage protection within broader urban development planning and it develops clear and sustainable policy options following the vision of Yangon as one of Asia's most livable cities. And it also provides technical assistance for conservation projects and it facilitates research and training. And so what uh, Momo will be sharing really, it's uh, I guess all through the, the research and the, uh, the, the case studies that, um, that the trust has actually taken on uh, in the last few years. Um, and really also looking at how how I guess um, how the idea of heritage could be defined in Myanmar and the question of what quality do these architectural treasures actually contribute to the city's built environment and how do we regard uh, these buildings as a source of pride for the city and how is how is their preservation how could their preservation could be secured so we just look forward to your presentation thank you Momo thank you Shelley uh, could you hear me well Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is my honor to be invited to be a part of this uh, online symposium. And thank you, especially uh, Morris and the uh, organizers uh, and uh, other contributors in this event. I approach uh, how we can do best in uh, conserving that architecturally valuable built environment, which is um, which, which comes after the war uh, 
uh, during uh, during the 14 years of the window period that uh, where Myanmar enjoyed um, the democratic um, uh, government and uh, and the new nation building. Uh, firstly. Firstly, I will just briefly talk you about what we are doing. We are non-government, non-profit organization that we have about, um, uh, we have a six uh, principal tasks to achieve our vision that just uh, Shelley has mentioned. So uh, we are mainly doing for the public advocacy by engaging with government businesses and public and professionals in um, that the heritage can be uh, uh, integral part of the urban planning so that uh, conservation is working together with the uh, planning concentration development uh, regulations and uh, po uh, development policies so that we can attain that uh, sustainable urban development um, in the long run so we doing the public advocacy on um, public policy development understanding heritage assets by doing the inventory and all, and listing, categorizing. So uh, the modern architects, uh, modernist architecture, um, properties in the cities are also part of our important heritage list. And uh, we do also technical assistance and capacity building, and we propose that uh, managing the long-term management of heritage properties to the government. So I'll touch upon here the context of that time, right after the independence and until the first coup happened in 1962. Uh, so in the 14 years, uh, we had uh, opportunity to receive those uh, innovative ideas in architecture and that actual, uh, that were built up in our soils and, uh, and uh, a lot of opportunities for the young practicing architects that time. So what are the significance of them so that how we could conserve them for the, uh, the long term? So I will explain first uh, the context of that time. It's a period between 48 to 62. So there, there are, I see that three driving force that uh, as a, because of the, the whole nation is very excited with the rebuilding of the new nation uh, and to fulfill the, all the growing needs after the World War II. And uh, another thing is the influence and relationship with the external world. Because of that time uh, after the war, there's uh, many um, uh, other government, uh, powerful governments are competing to influence this, uh, that world nations and how these nations reacting to these influences. And also I, when we talk about our architectural heritage, <clears throat> we should not forget the role of the decision makers <clears throat> at the time, how they are, <clears throat> excuse me, how they're willing to accept the, the new thing and uh, they're willing to spend uh, and uh, appreciate the designs and uh, and added to the city um, uh, built environment. That's I'm going to touch upon. And this is the photo that I would like to show here. Is is a right at the center of the city where you can see the three different periods uh, the architecture. There's a very ancient Mon Yamar period pagoda, Sule pagoda, and the city hall, which is uh, based in the colonial architecture, but because of the growing um, nationalist movement and uh, adding with the national character and the independence monument that uh, lay the foundation in the very day of the independence. And it built uh, <clears throat> for two years. Uh, that's purely a modern visual design. <clears throat> so after the war that uh, we have a, a lot of damages in and around the cities 
and uh, 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 rebuilding or rehabilitation a fort were made. Here's a photo showing that uh, the port uh, was uh, flattened by the bombard. And then the, after that uh, reparations agreement, there, there are a few um, port facilities were, were built up with a new design. And in terms of the architectural context, that uh, even the buildings that were built uh, in the colonial period can be considered as a modernist. Uh, you will see this building is completed in the early 1942, just before the war first hit to Yangon, uh, just a few months before. But fortunately, uh, it was spared from the bombed and uh, uh, it, it's, it has been quite a perfect condition after the war. But uh, though it was built in the colonial period, it already have uh, uh, showing of that um, modernism in the, its architecture. That has the first ever uh, underground car parking uh, in the city, in that building, in the less decorative elements. And uh, this is independent monuments, as I mentioned, and that design is inspired by the, by the new independent nations flag that, uh, that uh, Asterix uh, were volumized to make a monument uh, designed by the Myanmar engineer, Wong Chai, with the assistance of the uh, famous Myanmar architect, Putin. And uh, there's a key factors, I would say, in our modernist uh, architectural environment. It's a one, uh, it's a foreign policy of neutrality right after the war. And uh, the state, Obama practiced this neutrality in the fo foreign policy and became one of the regional leaders in the non ally movement. In terms of the development, it first moved to acquire you know, the Land uh, Nationalization Act and uh, previously owned by the foreign owners and uh, other properties um, relating to major industries. And, uh, and so uh, there's a, a lot of uh, national uh, things in the, in the new nation. And the National Housing Board was established uh, according to the National Housing Revolution of Town and Country Development Act, uh, which is responsible for providing the housing after the war town uh, cities and the, um, the, who, the, for the migrants who come to refuge in Yangon. So that uh, the, the, the move, the, the works of national NHP was uh, more accelerated in the later part of 1950s, when the expansion of three satellite towns in the outskirts of existing inner townships were uh, planned and built as part of the squatter relocation and, um, for the migrated population. And then another one is the welfare state, which is we call Iroda plan, that government plan with the assistance of KTA from the US for the economic and engineering development of Burma, which is in turn to, uh, for the development of um, industrial and agricultural in the eight years and five years plan. That uh, the advices in the Tiroda plan include for training of professionals in technical se se sector. So that include the young engineers, architects or management position. They were sent abroad, especially US to learn uh, in the technical uh, skills in the professional. Uh, and then they are assigned to come back here to teach in the newly established uh, university, especially technical universities. So the right photo, this is the, the first set up uh, engineering college uh, on the on P Road. Uh, you will see there's uh, the, the 
Myanmar art uh, portray that uh, engineering tools, the teaching tools uh, the, in the art. And the, and the Colombo plan that is also the corporate economic development in the South and Southeast Asia. So that was uh, the support funded for the training of the technical tech, uh, professionals. So the government have uh, infrastructure improvement like a new airport or the, the bridges and other infrastructure, as well as the new technical universities and technical high schools and uh, the new um, offices for the new departments. So these were built in the, in the modern uh, fashion. And uh, the, uh, part of the welfare state plan, there's uh, a few uh, large scale housing projects were popped up and uh, that some um, many were designed, brought in from, uh, the, from by the foreign architects and later by the uh, homegrown architects. And in his paper during the Dublin conference, Jeff Cody has categorized uh, three architectural cultures at play during the, this period in Myanmar. The first is the culture of capitalist stewardship. So there's a more like a Western influence and uh, the education or the training has given uh, and also the direct practice, uh, the foreign architects practice directly here. And another one as because of the, the whole global situation, uh, uh, condition is in a, under the Cold War competing each other. There's a um, Russia and China influences over the country that also have um, received some of that, um, that uh, influence uh, in the architecture. And the third, as I may said, that is because of the local architects were trained in the West and then it's combined with the local knowledge and the, and the characters and identity and the climatic condition. So uh, uh, these are the products of that period that engineering schools in the top two and the um, one is uh, from the US architect uh, and uh, the second is uh, as a gift of uh, the Secretary Roosevelt's visit to Yangon in 1958 and um, the airport and um, the Inalek Hotel, which is the idea of the Soviet socialists in the um, that's the resort uh, by the lake uh, where the workers or the government staff can have um, uh, take the, the relaxation. So the, for the point of conservation, we always have to see why this architecture is important and how they are significant in their own right, as well as how uh, in, in, the, in the city landscape, as well as in the public eyes. So uh, I would say that um, uh, setting and scale, uh, which is fit to the Yangon's landscape, the architectural value, the cultural and climatic features, structural advances, and how they have been representing their time at that time in particular. The photo is an advertisement of Mr. Bama, that Mount Bama bicycle, which show the strength, new, fresh, and high quality local manufacturer products, the bicycle, in comparing with the tall duck and young men with the background of the newly built Ialik Hotel, uh, uh, which is uh, the, the newly created architecture environment that is very much attractive to the public eyes. Setting and scale, most of the new development at that time were spread out in the suburb, at that time suburban 
uh, areas uh, because of all the, the projects are large scale and they occupy the large plot of land, like a university's compound or the even the Yalek hotels. So they are now sitting on the very expensive um, townships in the city where the, the high demand of the large land has been quite limited. So they are any how is in the verge of uh, demanding on the new development. So how that can be managed is a question in the, in the new, uh, in the present time and the development trend. And some are refit project because of uh, some bombed bird area in the downtown that uh, replaced with the newly built uh, modernist architecture uh, at that time with mostly in the commercial building offices or the government structure. And in terms of architectural value, the building was built in right after the war uh, the, by the, the design by the Myanmar architect Sidu Bujin. So this is in the, in the comparable to the other modernist architecture, but because of the, the growing nationalism at that time, there's a, um, the nationalist characters are uh, put it in uh, combining into the structure. And uh, the Bitika Dai, which is uh, at that time, the prime minister would like to have the whole compound with the, the, for the religious studies and uh, uh, for the other uh, purposes. And they hire the US architect, Benjamin Fogt, who has studied a lot of that uh, in the India and they, um, he could, uh, trying to represent the ideas of the client into that building. That's uh, a lot of features with the uh, um, details and features. And uh, the engineering school, and briefly after that, it become the uh, University of Medicine. But uh, this is a quite, quite a showcase of um, in, in the city with the uh, the patterns, the details, the features, and the motives. And this is another technical school near the Kanoji Lake. Uh, uh, that's uh, Reg Reglan Square. Square, the, the US arch architect has uh, been had a, a lot of chances practicing in Yanko. That include also the private house. And um, this is uh, one of those, and it's really maintained very well. Uh, the, the owner decision to still to maintain that one. And uh, th this is another uh, technological university that has been given by the um, uh, Russian government. This is also the uh, Yale Hotel given by Russian architects and uh, government. And uh, those buildings also have another significance is uh, interior details, uh, local art and in, in the features of the tropical characters. Uh, many uh, grand details and interior uh, motives. This is from the Gabai. Uh, with all these paint and the uh, creation and uh, very um, beautiful stairs and uh, all these um, paint uh, by the Myanmar artists and a uh, mural art uh, in the buildings. And the details of the details that uh, the climatic um, protection features and uh, patterns and uh, uh, are also very well uh, associated in the significances. 
Another thing is uh, uh, after the colonial um, architecture in the past, at that time, a lot of concrete and uh, steel has been <clears throat> very flexible to, 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 to fulfill the designer's creativity. So the large span um, uh, buildings were be able to build at that time. <clears throat> And the right side, the Namal Technical High School Hostel, that has been up until like a later 90, 1980s, that was the highest um, building in the city. Uh, and uh, sadly, this building was uh, demolished in the early 1990s due to the uh, not able to maintain, keep keep uh, or maintain or prepare it, uh, maybe the lack of the technology to, to, to restore this one. This was uh, also one of uh, Regland Square uh, architectural um, design, but uh, he would like to add that the assembly hall with the freely, free ventilation and lighting, but uh, in order to make the large span, he chose that form. So it's uh, very uh, well known as a turtle back hall. Uh, in order to have the span and the shape, um, he has a lot of experiments and, um, and found that uh, the tikut uh, as product of Myanmar is the best suit to make the form and covered with a copper sheet. But um, and then uh, th there's a significant way of technological invention here to to control the sound system. But uh, I think after thirty years um, that uh, can cannot keep it. Uh, that is another um, Brooklyn Square. Uh, no, the Nagler's. Uh, Oswald Nagler designed that uh, recreation center in the Yangon University campus, that also another uh, structural building. So all these buildings have been, because of that, uh, the government sponsored building and many, most of them that uh, large scale buildings are public building. So they, are quite significant in social life of the people as well. So, uh, for example, that Tuttleback um, Hall has been dearly loved by the, the students, and um, they were so sad seeing that was um, dismantled. And um, and uh, for example, the row of uh, cinemas in the city or or. So um, the buildings are also very important in the public life, and they represent that at that time how the Myanmar uh, enjoy that uh, that uh, uh, prosperous uh, moment uh, with in, in in terms of economic politics and um, and uh, social and education. So in order to carry that legacy, uh, uh, marks into the decades later with all these, though the in, uh, constructions are, are not affordable, uh, uh, while under the socialist government, uh, they can still show their uh, creativity in, the, in, in their architectural. So for the, uh, with this topic of, of this conference, the symposium, future of modernity, how we can conserve all these. Of course, that um, that how we appreciate 
this uh, as an important uh, treasure of the, the city heritage that is that that is that needs uh, advocacy to increase awareness and appreciation and uh, only legal protection. But with uh, other heritage conservation, they are in the list and um, they are also uh, considered as an uh, important city heritage. Uh, not all, but uh, but uh, many uh, the, the modernist building are all, are seen important. Regular maintenance is needed, and, and continuous usage and operation is needed because a few of the buildings were uh, under use uh, during the 1970s or so they have got a lot of damages and the weather um, uh, damages. And um, um, the buildings, if they're easily adaptable, because of the, that modernist buildings are so spacious in the, in the, the large scale, and they have uh, uh, class, they are easily adaptable. And um, uh, the, they occupy the land, which is uh, very expensive now. So they're viable. So if they are considered, it can be uh, considered reused uh, instead of replacing. So remodeling or alteration or, or the change of use, the new development should be very sympathetic to the existing structure and the environment. And we also need the technical know-how uh, because of, in case of that, uh, Shuttle back uh, hall because of technical knowledge is not adequate and um, that uh, wrong decision to to dismantle it. The modernist housing because of the lack of regular maintenance and the, and the uh, inadequate control over the ownership or the who's responsible. That's uh, after 40 years, they have a, a lot of uh, rundown and, um, and, and uh, become dangerous in some cases. So uh, all the governments um, with that, uh, the complaints or, uh, or because of the land price, they tend to redevelop with, uh, in collaboration with the private sector in the PP, redevelop the site so that the added con high-rise uh, high condominium or multi-story uh, apartments that to, to return to the existing um, room owners or the another additional commercial spaces are added. So they become that uh, large-scale mixed-use development site. So, uh, would that be uh, all agreeable? Because of some community, their environment is changing. So the way they live for four, five decades has been totally changed. But that that is still very controversial. Who, uh, because of the development demand over the site and uh, how people want to live in the better condition. So that, that that, that needs an um, answer and um, that need to be agreed by the all stakeholders. And uh, some of the, the commercial district shop houses in the downtown, they also have a lot of been um, tear down in the, in the past decades. But over, over in the last uh, few years that they also know their value and uh, the, the demand is also to the heritage or the restoration or the uh, attraction that has been um, surfaced on the on the on the development trend, so they also consider to to remodel and convert it into the modern uh, commercial spaces. That is good, but uh, maybe not all will follow suit into that kind of decision. And I would like to hear the few examples that we involved in the latest. Uh, because of the, the 
the technical technological university have that uh, old dining hall uh, is since in the, the um, time that was uh, uh, that was been and used for the, the last two decades and then now the the university or the education ministry want to because of the request of the students in the unions they they would like to convert it into the uh, student centers so in last year even during the, the pandemic uh, break there has been the renovation is ongoing and is almost done with the and the architects are also the freshly graduates and um, they all under 30 and uh, all our government ministry of uh, education has funded all the and because of the new buildings are also needed to, to improve the existing cafeteria that uh, the young architects design that is fit to the that type of butterfly hall. So they use the repetitively the existing patterns of the screen wall to the, that low rise um, uh, buildings and the new uh, sports hall and the new students halls are also uh, uh, on the line, the sports center has been almost, uh, I think it's already completed. So that, that, that is a way of saving that um, architectural, that modern environment with the uh, new uh, harmonic, uh, more, more uh, new development that fit to the, the existing surroundings and uh, respecting to the existing buildings. Uh, I think that's all. I here would like to mention because I use a lot of photos that uh, from the individuals and the pages and website here I have listed. Thank you. Oh, thank you Momo for a really detailed uh, survey. Uh, for us who do not know, you know, about Myanmar architecture, this is almost like a great kind of a journey, but also really appreciate your very kind of uh, comprehensive kind of like sharing about the kind of criteria that you use to evaluate uh, what how what these how these buildings are of significance, and also just a wonderful ending with the case study. Hopefully, there'll be more of these case studies. So the next one uh, was our second last speaker. It's uh, Christoph. Yes, uh, any. Did I hear somebody say something? Okay, Christoph uh, Rahut, and I hope I said your last name correctly. So Christoph is the uh, kind of uh, has been the state conservator and director of the Berlin State Monument Authority since October 2018. And before that, he was an advisor at the office of the German National Committee for Monument Protection at the federal government. Um, and so right now we and also he was the commissioner uh for culture and the media starting in 2016 so many more roles there but today he is going to be sharing uh particularly will be how modernist buildings have been conserved in berlin and i particularly appreciate your kind of a statement about how uh, buildings in the 70s and 80s are particularly hard uh to kind of uh, pinpoint as something worthy of conservation so we would love to hear your presentation on that thank you Yes, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to the uh, conference at the Posium. I'm uh, learning a lot and I, I do hope that you will also learn a bit about um, what we currently do in Berlin in regards to modernist architecture. I just, uh, and um, I will give you a, a very brief uh, introduction or uh, um, insight maybe in, in two uh, or three um, topics which are um, very important for us uh, right now and which we are um, working on uh, and, and which kind of describe our practice as the um, Monument Authority for Berlin. Um, my, my focus will be on the question of um, what kind of buildings do we list as um, list-worthy architecture as heritage at the moment? Um, and I will also show you a bit of the difficulty, uh, uh, knowing that I will not go too much detail into the questions of conservation and preservation, 
which uh, could be another uh, topic to present to you. Um, and I would like to start uh, by introducing that I will have two focuses. One will be uh, looking at housing, which will be the second. And I would like to start with um, hinting you at the fact that we have in, Be in Berlin um, looking at the, the heritage, uh, the architectural um, heritage of the post-war uh, period from 1945 to the uh, end of the Berlin Wall, of the fall of the Berlin Wall, we do have a lot of uh, very large objects which um, are um, very decisive for the city, uh, decisive for the history of the city, and, and also very worthwhile looking at in terms of architectural um, value. And um, I'm, I'm showing you just a few here um, to show you also what have, has been achieved over the last 10 years in um, preserving those buildings. Those um, buildings are all buildings which uh, um, we have been looking at over the last uh, 10 years. And um, we have started to uh, formally list um, uh, buildings such as, for example, the Thälmann uh, Siedlung, uh, the um, uh, hospitals, um, as you see here uh, below, the um, Teufelsberg, um, and this was for the for the first uh, half of the the last decade. Uh, I would say a, 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 start, a process was started, which really gained. Uh, on speed during the last few years where we were able to, to list uh, an, a number of really large buildings, for example, the International Congress Center, the ECC, which is uh, very well known here in Berlin as the spaceship, uh, which landed in the city, or for example, the Friedrichstadtpalast, which is the uh, very uh, important um, cultural place in the, in the former GDR. Um, or, for example, the airport of Tegel. And the airport of Tegel is uh, a good example, uh, I think, of um, what um, is also the difficulty in um, preserving such buildings and also listing such buildings uh, as, as heritage. Um, this airport was built uh, in the 70s, was a, a great win of the um, office of Gerka, Mark and Partner, which started to, to build up one of uh, Germany's biggest architectural offices uh, after uh, winning this competition for the International Airport of West Berlin. And um, obviously this is a, a highly functional uh, building. Um, it is built at the time um, where the, the, the airplanes and, and the car was, were the two most important infrastructural elements. And um, this entire building is um, designed uh, for um, cars and airplanes, basically. And this is kind of what is also the difficulty today that our um, approach on mobility is, is changing, also our approach on um, uh, the, the technical infrastructures of, of buildings uh, is changing, but we do have those buildings from the 70s, 80s, which are highly technical, highly functional, and all uh, very often single use buildings. And um, this airport was in use un uh, till uh, autumn last year. And um, uh, it is actually that we only half a year before this airport was uh, shut down and is no longer in use as an airport, that we did list this building as heritage. And this is obviously very interesting because when you look at the, um, the process, um, so I, I wanted to show you this building to, to remind you that it's also not, the airport is not just the, the terminal building, but it's also a, a number of further buildings. So it's a really uh, large area. And, Listing such a building at that time is obviously uh, very um, interesting since uh, we um, we are in the process where we say this is a, a, a place of the future. This is what the, the advertisement of the um, GmbH, um, which is running the, the redevelopment of this entire site, is saying it's the, the place of the future. And um, uh, at the same time, we're saying it's also a place to, uh, of history, 
um, of, of this city. And you can see that there's a lot of obviously development which will take place, which is also very uh, easy to do in, in, uh, since uh, airport includes a lot of space which can be, uh, can be um, developed. Um, but obviously it's also a question of how to, how to deal with the, the buildings themselves. And uh, you see here the, the design of uh, the architect BMP, which were the ones um, uh, who designed uh, the airport in, in the 70s and are now also part of the team to redesign this entire airport um, into different uses. The, the main uh, terminal building, Terminal A, will, for example, be um, a university building in the future. And, um, and this is also the, the, the um, big challenge we are, we are having here, that we are turning an airport building into a university building. So we, we do have a lot of changes which will also take place in this building. And, and listing this building was uh, um, uh, really a process that took almost uh, 10 years of discussion. I was only part of the last uh, few few years, and um, uh, and it did gain a lot of media attention. That's why I I show you these pictures on the right, where we are in the local uh, the news, um, in the local TV station. The the head of the the university and, and myself, and, and we were having this public argument about the, the value of this building and the um, how how important it is to list this building or how important it is to have this university here. So we were having this almost this uh, discussion about future and past. And I'm, I'm very happy that we were actually able to solve this. But this was with a lot of political attention. That's why I also show you the, the mayor um, of Berlin um, who, who had to, to uh, answer to such questions in, in public uh, press conferences. Uh, which showing you the level of uh, attention such processes do also uh, gain here in Berlin. Um, this is the, the part of the really big sites, the big heritage objects, which are a lot of uh, work in terms of um, also explaining, convincing, and um, uh, media, um, uh, yeah, media. Um, the other, uh, other important part of our work at the moment is to, to look at housing. Um, Berlin was divided for most of the uh, 20th century and especially for this, uh, most of the second part of the 20th century. Uh, and a lot of housing complexes reflect upon this um, special political situation. And I, I'm showing you just a list of a few uh, bigger housing complexes which were built during the uh, past uh, Second World War up to 1989. And to, 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 to verify to you how political housing can be, I would like to show you the Siedlung Ernst Thälmann, which was built in, in the 80s uh, by um, the Helmut Stiegel, Manfred Zumpe and Hubert Mattes and, and Furthers in the, uh, with the collective of uh, the GDR, um, which was in, in charge for uh, housing in the eastern uh, German part of Berlin. And um, Ernst Thälmann is the name of this, the, uh, this housing complex, but was also uh, one very important person at the uh, beginning of the GDR. And um, so uh, also the name, as well as the design of this um, uh, housing complex is, is very political. Right in the middle is this monument of Ernst Thälmann, which is, uh, is now part of a, a discussion of how to deal with such monuments. But uh, what I find important is that um, this monument is not just to be seen as a monument itself. It is part of that's why I always also show this um, uh, aerial picture. It's, it's part of this entire housing uh, project where you did specifically have four high rises to, to frame the, the monument. And um, this was one um, uh, housing complex which was listed uh, a few years ago, um, which is a very, as you can see here, a very typical um, uh, um, housing complex of the time. 
uh, and uh, built in the Plattenbauweise, so with prefabricated uh, concrete elements, uh, and which is one part of the um, of what we are looking at at the moment. Um, what I find interesting is that, especially in the 80s, um, there is a decisive change in in the the architecture of this uh, in uh, Berlin. Um, and, in both parts, east and west, and I'm, I'm showing you here an image which shows you in the in the back the, the housing development of the 70s, uh, the Fischer Insel. Um, this is not a listed monument. There has also been a lot of change, but in, in the front is what you, you see here um, is the... Um, uh, oh, sorry, I... Um, it's another housing complex. I, I forgot the name <laughs> at the moment. Um, the Nikolai Viertel, which is a very historic area of Berlin, but um, actually after the war, the only building remained was remaining was this church, which is a historical. All the other buildings you see here are actually buildings of the 80s, and you, I think this image shows you very well the the change in architecture and town planning from the 70s to the 80s. So the 70s are rather the large housing complexes, while the uh, 70s go back to smaller um, developments. They focus on uh, the city, um, and, and there's also a greater variety, variety in the architecture uh, itself. And that's something we can also see in the west part um, of, of Berlin, where we did have the international bow, uh, the inter Internationale Bauausstellung, so an international exhibition of architecture um, 18, in 1984, 87, uh, where many uh, architects from abroad, but also from Germany, did uh, marvelous works, very sophisticated architecture. I'm, I'm just showing you uh, some examples here. And um, those were done in several parts of um, West Berlin in so-called demonstrationsgebieten, so specific areas where architects were invited in um, uh, processes to, to contribute to, to the city. And this was also a layer which uh, very much formed West Berlin and the idea of housing of West Berlin in the 80s. And uh, many of those buildings are also now listed. This is a, a project which has been taken place for the last uh, five to six years. And what I also find interesting as a, a person in dealing with heritage is that we are also preserving here the heritage ideas of the 80s already, um, since they're also the, the architects at the time were very much uh, looking for solutions to deal with uh, the historic sort of, um, um, landscape and how to, to modernize it. And this is, for example, such an example of a uh, um, building from the early 20th century, then remodeled in, in the 80s and now uh, a listed building. Um, others are uh, new uh, buildings, for example, this um, larger housing estate from Muir Rubble and Jadel, um, which is, is a bit outside of the city center of Berlin, but uh, is maybe one part of the uh, POMO. SOS <laughs> exhibition from Oliver Elsner. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting uh, development, um, which has also been listed uh, last year. Um, going back to this map, um, this map was showing you uh, housing estates with up to 1,000 flats. Uh, what we also will be looking at is in the, in the near future, or what our plan is, to, to look a bit uh, at the larger housing estates. So where we, we do have certain uh, housing estates from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which uh, where, uh, do have more than 10,000 uh, units, uh, many of them in uh, east, in the east, former eastern part of Berlin. Um, and you can see by this uh, map already how, how large such um, areas are, so how large such housing um, developments were. Um, and, and they obviously also um, 
um, are a, <coughs> a, quite a challenge for the idea of conservation and preservation by the, the enormous size. Um, and um, th this is one question we will have to answer um, in the future. Um, I would like to, to finish by um, showing you a very unique example, uh, which is uh, now at the gains the most of the uh, attention in, in the Berlin press in terms of the question uh, preservation or de demolition, which is uh, the, the Mäusebunker. The uh, Mäusebunker is uh, a building built in the 70s, uh, finished in the 80s by uh, Gerd and Magdalena Henska, uh, architects from Berlin, um, which uh, was used by the Free University of Berlin and now the uh, until uh, last year by the Charité, uh, the local hospital, as a um, laboratory building for animal um, experiments. And um, you can also already see by the architecture that it has a very brutalist, one could say, a very strong architectural language. Um, um, here is, the, is an aerial view. It is opposite of another brutalist uh, building, a very fantastic building by Feeling and Gogel. Um, and this building is also no longer in use. It was uh, shut down by the uh, Charité last year, and we are now um, having a discussion about how to deal with this building, which is in the inside, almost uh, like the airport Tegel, highly functional, very specific. Um, it uh, has not a lot of height uh, in the uh, floors and, and also asks us the question of what to do with such a building in the future. Um, it, um, started by a local petition um, of, of two um, art historians. One was also part of the um, exhibition team, uh, SOS Brutalism. Um, there was a lot of discussion about whether to um, tear this building bow down or um, list it as a building. The specific um, challenge in this case is that the uh, Charité already has a permit to tear this building down. So we didn't have the chance to list this building and save it um, at the moment. Um, and um, what we did was to, to try to use this um, interest in the building to um, start a process um, to, to make our argument for preservation so strong that there is no chance for the Charité to tear this building bow down any longer but to, to put it really in the, the wider context of the discussion about our built, um, our built environment. Um, we called it Modellverfahren Mäusebunker, which is a, is a website. And this website um, has a, a number of purposes. Uh, one is that we did put all the information we had on this building on this website. So in, instead of um, having politicians in, in TV or in, in the newspaper um, uh, telling almost fairy tales about those, those buildings and uh, about the inside of how, how bad it was from the inside. We, we, we did a lot of work in um, showing the object, objective condition of the, of the building and by this um, making it as a, a, a doable task to preserve this building. Um, also showing, the, the, for example, the um, color concept and also the, the um, qualities of it, um, despite the fact that it was a building for animal testing for so many years. And the, the second uh, approach is that we say it, it's not just a question about architecture and the value of architecture, but we have to see the preservation of buildings in a, in a wider context and in a wider discourse. So we, we did collect a number of, of interviews, of positions, of uh, references uh, on the website um, on three further topics. Uh, cohabitation, which is especially interesting uh, um, in regards to a building which was used for, for animal testing. Then the question of greening futures, uh, caring for the built environment and how to 
for example, safe gray energy and such questions uh, in light of the climate crisis. And then the, uh, the idea of reimagining that we uh, have, to, have to be in, archi in, in architecture. We, our task is no longer to uh, imagine, but to reimagine our built environment. And by doing this, we were um, very successful to, to stop this process of um, the discussion of demolition, but turn it now rather into a discussion on what could this building be in the future. This is something which is happening uh, right now with a number of different statements from all kinds of um, persons from Germany, but also abroad. And this is uh, one of the um, most exciting processes we are um, dealing with right now. And I think if we can learn something from this process is that if we want to be successful as a, as a heritage office, uh, or as, as people uh, fighting for, for the heritage, for the modernist heritage, the most important tool we have is uh, publicity um, to um, write books, to uh, have exhibitions, to make videos, to have prizes, to have discussions. And this is um, also getting more and more important for such institutions as we are, um, not just museums uh, are um, so the, the places where uh, the discussions should take place, but also within the institutions dealing with such questions. We need this discussion and, and, and this is what I try to um, achieve at the moment. Thank you for the intention. Well, thank you, Christoph. I, I wish we can find out more because I think you presented a really uh, great case, I mean, great case study of how this whole process, not just beyond advocacy, but really kind of like helping the process of reimagining and reuse. Uh, so I think uh, I hope that presents a lot of uh, a lot of encouragement for what uh, Johannes is doing in Singapore. <laughs> so so it's um, it's great. So the next uh, speaker is our last one. But I think it will be a very uh, different uh, case studies. And I think from another part of the world, uh, from Sri Lanka, so uh, Shayari is um, is our next speaker, and she just to introduce, she's an architect uh, whose practice focuses on curatorial and editorial projects. She joined the Lunuganga Trust, uh, which is basically also part of the Jeffrey Bawa Trust as curator for art and arch archival collections in 2018, where she manages the Jeffrey Bawa collections, including programs around exhibition, publication, and conservation. So the recent uh, amazing set of program that she curated was the year-long Bawa 100 Centenary Celebration Program. And so today she's going to be uh, really kind of uh, bringing out two main case studies, uh, which I am very thankful that I got to visit one of them uh, and really completely super impressed. And that's the physical re relocation. So the end entire thing being dismantled and then reassembled uh, or rebuilt at the Ina de Silva house in 2016 by Bawa, as well as the renovation of the Saram house uh, in 2018. And so, yeah, so Shayari, we'll just let you share with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shirley, and um, thank you for having me on this panel. I've been uh, learning so much and furiously taking notes. Um, so I'm, as you said, uh, joining from Colombo, a little bit west of Southeast Asia, um, and going to really, f I'm actually going to focus on one project, the Ina de Silva House. Um, just taking a step back, uh, Jeffrey Bauer um, established the Jeffrey Bauer Trust in 1982 while he was alive with the um, intention of uh, fostering and furthering architecture, the arts and um, ecological and environmental studies. And when the architect passed away in 2003, the trust inherited uh, his estate, which included um, his property, so his uh, incredible garden Lunuganga in uh, south of Colombo, his home in number 11, um, his collection of art and um, art that he had collected as well as designed both in in both properties and then his archive uh, or the archive of his practice which includes over 5,000 drawings as well as some uh, correspondence and um, photographs. So this is the kind of collection within which um, the trust is uh, looking at how do you archive this practice and um, what is really the purpose of um, archiving this kind of work. 
along with these sort of tangible um, aspects, I believe there's also an intangible aspect that is vital to really understanding uh, these practices in retrospect. And so we have begun um, an oral histories project, speaking to his colleagues, clients, um, friends, to understand um, his approaches, which were different in different periods of his life and at different, uh, for different projects. Um, the Trust is also quite lucky that we still have um, a fair number of staff that actually worked while he was alive in preserving these properties, and these are also incredible resources. Um, another kind of particular aspect to looking at um, this particular body of work is Bauer's own approach, which was, um, he was an architect who really engaged processes of entropy. Um, you know, the architecture is meant to be experienced with uh, layers of sort of leaves that are flattened down from the trees and um, he actively actually um, engaged or kind of created these um, processes of decay actually so he would often leave um, a new piece of furniture out in the rain to weather it extra fast. Um, here you see a mural done by uh, a quite famous artist and friend of Jeffrey Powers, Lucky Sanenaika, which was done while Lucky was recovering from um, typhoid uh, at Lunuganga. He does this incredible battle scene drawing. Um, and in fact, much of the um, art and collections that are uh, in these properties are actually vital to the architecture and they kind of grew together. Um, and Bawa, while he was alive, would use his walking stick to poke holes in this roof uh, so that rain would come in and a kind of layer of um, of moss would grow over um, and create this kind of patina. And this, of course, pre uh, presents a huge challenge to us because um, we can't, it's very, very difficult to maintain just the right level of patina and not lose the painting altogether. Um, he, as an architect, also uh, really sort of engage not just with spaces in a very specific way, but also with time. So here you see one of his last projects, uh, a hotel from 1996 um, in Kandalama, and um, it's in this dry zone jungle, and you see it on the left as it was built. But Jeffrey always imagined it um, really getting taken over by this jungle. As you can see, it slowly is becoming um, in the photograph on the right, and in fact, Chandan Daswat, um, one of our trustees and an architect who worked very closely with Bawa on this project, has said that um, Bawa said the project would actually only be complete when it is jungle once more and sort of roamed by the elephants and leopards of the area. Um, so this is the kind of um, context of the architect specifically. Uh, he also really believed that architecture was meant to be experienced and so he um, he, this is a quote from him, he said, One f one's feeling in a room constantly alters one moves around it, particularly in the perception of outside and adjacent spaces. What I mean is that when you design anything, say that end wall there, you have to consider seeing through it, past it, around it, from all different points of view. The landscape is a moving picture that one is inside of. It is a continuum in which all sides appear simultaneously. Um, and so when we think about conserving this work, we have to also think about its essence, its intentions, um, against a kind of larger context, which is the context of um, modern architecture in Sri Lanka. So we do have other challenges. For example, there's not really any state funding for conservation, um, especially conservation of architecture that doesn't fall into the kind of category of antiquity. Um, there isn't the sort of state recognition or the structural mechanisms um, that conserve modern heritage. So uh, we don't have a heritage authority, which would be an incredible asset in, a, in this kind of context. Um, there aren't the kind of financial and legal systems that establish support of preservation. Uh, so there aren't, for example, tax breaks for donating to charities, even registered charities like the Jeffrey Bauer Trust. Um, and then in addition, Bauer's architecture doesn't always take the most um, obvious, perhaps from a Western point of view, um, sort of semblance of modern architecture. And we've, uh, it's been wonderful to, to have this feeling of camaraderie in discussing this. Um, how do you make the case that this is, in fact, modern architecture? 
Um, and then, of course, you have our environment, which uh, with high humidity and high heat uh, means that decay happens very, very quickly. So in this larger context, I'm going to now turn to one particular house. It's a really paradigmatic uh, house in terms of Bauer's oeuvre as well. It's the Ina de Silva house, which was designed between 1960 and 1962. Just to give you a tiny bit of context, uh, Sri Lanka, like Burma gains, um, uh, Myanmar, excuse me, uh, gains independence in 1948. Jeffrey Bauer himself uh, only qualifies as an architect in 1958, um, having first worked as a lawyer. So this, this is quite an early project for him. Um, and um, has a very close engagement with the vernacular, which is one of the reasons it's not often considered to be a modern project. Um, but of course, uh, as Bauer himself has pointed out, um, everyone from Le Corbusier to Frank Lloyd Wright looked at, the, looked at the vernacular, looked at the past in order to look forwards. And um, um, I have to say that Jeffrey Bauer himself, actually, we've never, we don't have any record of him using the word modern. I think he removed himself from that discourse. Um, but um, when we look at this project, what we see is actually it doesn't take a it doesn't take a kind of rupture from the past. It it's more that it establishes a continuum. And if we look at the plan here, um, it's actually a very small site in a um, what was at the time rapidly densifying Colombo. And unlike the colonial um, houses that had preceded it, which would often sit as a block within um, a site and look outwards, what you see here is a very high wall and a project that re a house that really looks inwards to its courtyard. Um, now the courtyard itself is a very traditional uh, trope across ethnicities and geographies in Sri Lankan dwellings. Uh, but it is actually radically reinvented in this house. And um, what you see in this section here is this veranda that wraps around the courtyard in the middle. Um, and here you see that the courtyard is on the same level as the central plane of the house, which is very different to how um, um, the traditional courtyard was established, which would be sunken and the house itself would sit on a plinth raised above the ground. And what that does is um, instead of separating the courtyard from the house, it really expands the space of this, of what was at the time a small house. Um, and really engages everything from the bedrooms upstairs to the living spaces with this courtyard. Um, and this is very contemporary. Um, here you see also the house sitting in its original site. You see the very narrow street. And as a modern house, one that engages um, an urban setting, you see that it's also set back. And it actually, despite the fact that it's on a side plot, a small site, it has this um, quite substantial paving, which allows it to engage with the street, even though, even as it walls itself off. Um, and if you look at the court, and these are um, photographs by Jeffrey Bauer, you see the living space, you see the way um, it looks right onto the courtyard and you can walk right through. Um, you also see the house is strewn with um, and art objects made by so the client, Ina de Silva, um, becomes a great friend of Jeffrey's and is a batik uh, design. She kind of, again, reimagines batik traditions in uh, a workshop that she establishes first in this house. And you see how those objects are placed within the house. And um, this project is also important in Jeffrey Bauer's practice because it established um, it was very popular, it was seen as a great success, and he got many commissions following this. Um, also, the drawings that we looked at were, um, they, were kind, they were a different way of engaging sight and a different way of drawing architecture that then got followed actually throughout um, Bauer's practice. Then in 2009, um, the client, Ina de Silva, who um, was um, in her 80s, um, wanted to sell this house because the street which had been dense even at the time, was almost impossible to live to. It was next to a large hospital. Um, and the question of, you know, she would sell the land, but what happens to this house that 
uh, was universally um, acclaimed as being incredibly important in the context of Sri Lanka's modern history. Um, and so a process was begun to dismantle it piece by piece, uh, labeling and categorizing every aspect of it. Um, so here you see a roof plan of the original house, and then you see um, a drawing where every reaper and rafter was numbered, uh, both on the plan and then for, on the actual timber. Um, this was primarily engineered by Milan Kure. I have to tell you that I'm, I, um, engage, I joined the trust after this project was done, so I'm looking at it retrospectively. Milan was, um, he's trained as both an architect and archaeologist, so he was instrumental in this process of um, identifying the exact orientation and shape of every river stone that was used in the paving. Um, and then the house is taken down and rebuilt. And then, in fact, uh, for a while it was supposed to be reassembled at the University of Moratua, which is the, uh, one of the oldest um, faculties of architecture in Sri Lanka. That didn't happen. And eventually the decision was made to reassemble it adjacent to Lunuganga uh, on a site owned by the Trust. Um, and incredibly much of the drawing was done by hand. It was a very involved process as you can imagine. Um, here you see architect Amina Demel who was the project architect and again really instrumental in the process of rebuilding the house. Um, and every, every piece of timber, the stair which um, is held together by a single timber column um, and I think a big test in this whole process was whether everything would fit at the end and it did. Um, here you see the house coming up at Lunuganga and you see that it is no longer in an urban setting and in fact it is now set back from a quite verdant um, environment and I think this was definitely a compromise that had to be made but there was no alternative really or an urban site that was offering itself um, for this relocation. Um, and here you see it rebuilt at Lunuganga. Um, every effort was made to exactly match the house from everything from the planting to um, the artwork which was so important to it. Um, you see here uh, the batiks from Ina's practice that we re-established. She also had this collection of antiques and again it's, it is really this um, house that is looking back as it looks forward um, and the stair as it's finished um, and of course um, I included this poem by George Perrick because the process of dismantling is one thing but um, the process of bringing it back together and then what do you do with it um, this has really been the challenge for the trust um, in order to maintain and manage um, the properties that it does, as I think Momo also mentioned, it's you have to be able to use them regularly, um, manage them through, um, you know, you cannot, you know, in, in this part of the world, if you close a house within two weeks, um, its environment is really completely different. And it, this house has shown us um, during times of COVID that if that happens, it will just be covered in moss. Um, so what the Trust has done, and this actually happened before um, this house, it started with Lunuganga itself, is a process of renting spaces as, um, as places for tourists and visitors to stay. And this has been, um, of course, controversial, but also it has been one of the only ways in a, that a private um, institution with no support um, sort of externally has been able to actually manage and preserve these spaces. And it's also in line with what Bawa understood that these spaces had to be lived in to really be experienced. Um, this, um, this approach has now been taken to a couple of other projects, so I'll very briefly show those to you. Um, one is the Druvi de Serum House, which is from 1986. Here you see an original photo by Jeffrey Bauer on the left, and then the reconstructed house. Um, again, this project is really important because it is owned, uh, the client, Druvi de Serum, is one of Sri Lanka's foremost pianists. And um, also his collection of modern art, which you can see some really key examples in this music room space, um, 
is actually this house tells that story of how art and architecture evolved together in Sri Lanka and how much interplay there really was between these disciplines. Um, and lastly, um, an equally important project is the Benthuta Beach Hotel, um, the first resort in Asia, in South Asia, um, built between 1967 and 69. Um, and again, it may not uh, appear to be a modern project. Uh, you see this photograph is taken by Dr. Puloga Sundram, who was the structural engineer behind it and also um, Jeffrey Bauer's partner during his architectural practice and you see his shadow here. And what's really amazing about this project is um, the clients had, uh, in order to keep up with contemporary demands of tourism, they needed to expand it. And there was no way to do that with the existing structure and also also because of the way the site had eroded, the shoreline had changed. And so the entire thing, like the United Silva House, was taken apart and rebuilt with a wing um, added to it. And in that process, um, uh, the architect was trying to ask about that. He and um, the engineer discovered that, in fact, the this truss, this concrete, reinforced concrete truss here is what this upper floor plate is hung, hung from. So it's actually a suspended floor plate, on, floor plate on the top level, which is what allows for such thin floor plates. And so what we find is that it actually is an incredibly modern um, approach. It is only possible because of the techniques and materials that were unlocked by this period that caused what we know as modernism. Um, and um, this project is, again, because it's one of the most famous projects by Jeffrey Bauer and um, is frequently cited as one of the reasons why his work is not obviously modern. Um, but we, from a structural point of view, and when we, when once this was identified, what you actually, what we were able to observe was that from 1958 to 1968, if you look at a sequence of works by him, you see that this um, typology is developed sort of sequentially, um, uh, first through, buttress, through small overhangs, then with buttress structures, and finally this is kind of solution that is arrived at. Um, when the project reopens once more as a hotel, um, there's a kind of recursiveness that comes in because Ina de Silva, whose house we've just looked at, um, who then forms this incredibly important batik practice, um, those, and those batiks were what adorned the ceiling of this project in 67. And so they were remade exactly as they were um, matching colors as closely as possible with the existing dyes um, to become this space once more. Um, so this is the kind of approach that we've been taking with um, projects, often because private clients also have very limited resources and very limited approaches for to keep these structures going and to keep that to preserve them obviously um, one of the challenges that we have is uh, Bao also designed a lot of really important public buildings and um, including the Sri Lankan parliament uh, this parliament is in fairly good condition but a lot of the others are not um, but there isn't the kind of infrastructure in the country to find ways to use these places um, you know everything that um, we've been hearing has just made me so wistful and I think it's the step that we need to get to find ways to establish um, partnerships between um, organizations like the Trust and then larger state institutions. Um, of course, there's been so much instability in Sri Lanka's recent history. I think that's also been one of the challenges that, um, you know, in addition to the civil war and then um, in the 10 years since, since 2009, um, there's just been so many shifts in government which hasn't allowed for those types of long-term partnerships. And I think that's definitely a challenge that we've been trying very hard to reckon with. Um, but that is, um, that's an example from Colombo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shayari. I, I'm just, yeah, thank you for even just the very detailed story of Ina da Silva. I was just amazed when I went and I just wondered how this is done. And I think it's a story that needs to get disseminated. <laughs> so it's, uh, I hope we can, you know, find it somewhere online, just find out the entire process because it's such a, such an amazing mm -hmm. attempt. Um, and I think, I think the, the idea of, you know, turning this into a facility or infrastructure for hospitality 
you know, itself as part of the economy is almost inevitable, but at the same time, still in line with the spirit of what it means to be experiencing the dwellings that that Bawa had designed, you know, so I think it's, you know, always ways in which it could still be aligned with what, it's, what it was intended to be, right? So, exactly. I think, um, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, we are kind of like entering a Q&A session. Um, we want to invite everyone who is still online. Thank you for the 58 people who are still online right now, please enter your questions in the chat box. Um, and then I'll, we will try to field them and then bring them up to the speakers. But while we are waiting for those questions, I just have kind of three questions um, for some of the speakers. I know it's like six of you, uh, it's a lot. So I will just try to kind of maybe address it to a few speakers first and then to another set of speakers. So the first one I had was just something to do with what, um, I guess what Shayari also brought up uh, kind of uh, just now, which is the idea of how we define modern. So it raises the question of uh, the criteria of evaluating what is worthy uh, of advocating, advocating kind of like preservation or like, you know, of, 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 of listing them, you know, all of these. So, so far in terms of all the speakers, I find that there's these two patterns. One pattern is about pluralizing the definition of the criteria that it could be more like, so what is brutalist here could be not just uh, a set of like uh, Benham's criteria, but then there's another direction, which is very clear, very kind of singular, uh, which is I think the one that, um, yeah, like kind of like between very cl a clarity about what is modern or modernness or what's worthy of, 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 of preserving. Uh, but the other one is almost like this criteria keeps changing. We can almost be very inclusive about it. So I just wanted to kind of like get some thoughts, I guess, about how are these criteria that you came up with something that you know is going to change? Or are these something that you're convinced that we're going to stand by this uh, as a way for us to recognize what is worthy of, uh, of really kind of protecting or, or advocating for? So can I just uh, maybe pinpoint first uh, between maybe a discussion between, uh, yeah, I, I noticed it in Oliver's uh, and also Johannes, uh, but also in, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think those, yeah, and even in Momo's, uh, Momo's, you have a very clear criteria about what you think is worthy. Um, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. I hope my question is clear <laughs> so, about definitions and criteria of evaluating. Well, can I start first? Yes, oh, please. Uh, well, I'm a bit sleepy, sorry. But uh, <laughs> can I sketch something? Yes, um, of course. But it's difficult. Okay. Okay. Would no, you be I able to, to share your, uh, I guess, your, your screen? <laughs> uh no no it's okay it's it's, it's a bit difficult i i can't find the the share but okay let me try uh since the very beginning of our infantry project we developed a so-called uh, man butterfly methods so it's butterfly with left high, uh, left brain right brain uh, emotional and rational and then you have these uh three arms for the butterfly left and right so let's start with the rational the rational, the below is past, middle is present, and the other, at the top is future, right? So it's a time. So it's a spidergram, a very simple spidergram. So uh, a rational past is called history with all this empirical data and so on. So you can have a rate of being zero and five or whatever. And then the middle part, uh, rational, is the conditions. So how is the condition of the buildings right now? And the top part is the so-called the universality, the, the values, the theoretical values. Okay, and then the right side, uh, the, 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 the emotional side, below is called memory. How much people still remember all these values and everything? And then the middle is love. Love. Whether you really love it, love, yes. And then the emotional future is happiness. Okay, so you can have a very healthy butterfly pattern, then this is very significant. It's very small string, yeah. Then, well, maybe you can just forget it. If it's imbalanced, so you have the rational very, very uh, healthy, but on the other side, the emotion is less. Then we see, well, we need to to make people fall in love again. So it's more like an engagement program. So it's a strategy to to, to make people more aware about that. But if the emotional is very strong, but the rational is very weak, yeah, imbalanced then, well, we need to do more research to justify that. So this uh, are a very uh, useful to, to look into, say, like uh, after looking into like 500 or 600 uh, samples from uh, Jakarta, for example, we can reduce that into, say, about 200. 
and then it can be reduced further into 100 or 50. So it's more like a, a, a tool for conversations because this is, um, we, we, we put it online sometimes and we use this for a public engagement for discussions to discuss about this, this butterfly. So it's very flexible and it's very dynamic. It may change over time, but it's very helpful to, to, to make justifications for conservation, but at the same time also a, a, a basis for actions. If we want really to make it to save that for whatever reason, mm. then we can use this as a strategy. Thank you, Johannes. You have kind of spread it out, you know, in like a, this dynamism kind of a mode of how you define things. So wonderful. Any response from the other speakers to Johannes's map? <laughs> Butterfly map. Uh, I agree with that uh, because it's a theoretically it's correct. And um, that's also it's with the evidence with a lot of research. Um, but uh, I don't know in the practicality because uh, the conservation also needs a lot of resources. And, and well, in practicality, uh, what, it's uh, all about money. <laughs> it's all about money. <laughs> Not only. <laughs> you have to be able to convince the developer and the government about incentive and also about how much money that you can save. If you want to save, uh, say, like something to do with carbon footprint or carbon whatever, then the developer will ask how much incentive that they have, or whether there is a carbon tax. So that is in reality, you know. But in the academic uh, level, well, we can always say this is beautiful, you know, but it's useless to speak about significance or architectural feature whatever to the developers. Yeah, Momo, you were gonna say something more than just uh, about finance, so. Will you about to say something? Yes, uh, I would like to highlight uh, the, the benefit of conserving things. And uh, when you're going to stick with the theory or then the, you, you may not have, the, you may not ma you, uh, maximize the benefit if it is involved with the community or the what kind of, not only the economic benefit, other social benefit, cultural benefit, or the how that uh, the, the, the restoration result is practically used continuously, whether it's really useful to have invested in just to save the structure, or whether it is more maximized the multiple result that is the, the, the I, I mean, you also include like a happiness, because just improving the things, maybe not the whole structure, but the, just the things to improve, the, maybe the, the public realm around or, or make the public have a space to come or come to look. Or if you can really maximize that can be like a, uh, uh, the tourist or the regular income in the future, but at least like a social benefit or cultural benefit by making, I don't know, it is just from the result of the restoration project, the expensive uh, conservation project. That's, that, that, that is why um, for me is uh, uh, just following the conservation rule, investing all your resources to, to, to up to the, the standard of the conservation may not be benefit well because of its uh, high resources being invested and the result is not that as expected. So I think that needs a lot of other consideration and the consultation with the communities or the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Momo. I was, of course, I uh, the natural person that I also wanted to uh, uh, ask this question, which uh, Christoph, you brought up like criteria just now, which I really appreciate the greening futures, the idea of reimagining and then and then the idea of like publicity, the importance of publicity, but those, those are more like as part of your strategies, right? But in terms of the question of criteria, you said it has to go beyond just like architectural value thing. So do you have any comment on that? The criteria you use to actually- that There are two levels to, to discuss this. Um, there's the criteria, how to, to define um, a modernist building or a listed building and um, 
we do have a, a Denkmal Schutzgesetz, a law which actually defines those criteria in general, uh, the historic value, the, the architectural value. Um, and, and then we have the, the task to uh, obviously to scientifically define what the historic value could be um, or what the architectural uh, value uh, would be. And um, in, in regards to the modern modernist heritage, um, we, we actually not tend to focus on this, this architectural um, uh, uh, art historian discussion too much um, because in, in, in I would say in real life, many buildings are also part of, of certain phases. They, they have been designed in the 70s, executed in the 80s. So it's, it's, it's very hard to, to pinpoint sometimes this very distinctively um, to one building, what might seem in the, the art historian um, perspective, uh, very clear. That's, that's one ex experience, especially when you, when you go into the inside, uh, buildings sometimes tend to be something different from, from the outside in, in the design, especially to the long process of, of, of construction. Um, but th this is one part which we, where we try to, to have our scientifically defined criteria in, uh, in the process. And, and we, we do take in all the, the work at universities, et cetera, uh, as our reference. Um, and, and the second is how to deal with the heritage and then um, the, the terms um, reimagining cohabitation um, are rather strategies in, um, in dealing with, with the heritage um, um, on, on two levels. Obviously, reimagining is an approach, um, but it's also a communication tool, to be honest. And, and for politicians, uh, for those who, who have to uh, have to provide the money uh, um, uh, to uh, to explain to them that um, preserving is, is much more than preserving uh, an artistic value of an, an, a building, but it's, it's, it's um, in, in my mind, preser preserving is really um, what our future should be in, 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 uh, in light of the climate crisis. Uh, first, we have to ask the question, can we preserve a building and what can we, or what can we do to preserve a building and keep it in use? And it is only the very last option to demolish something. It's, uh, it's, it's very important that we also have a, uh, a, a change in mind um, over the next years worldwide. And um, explaining the uh, uh, architectural value is, is, is one part of this story and is the one part where we are all very strong at, um, but we have to, to combine our forces with all those other discourses. Thank you. I'm curious, Oliver, um, as the, I guess, as the historian, you know, responding to <laughs> Christoph's comment about, yeah, it's more than just the architectural significance. Mm. Um, no, no, yeah, I, I fully, uh, first of all, I fully agree that, that uh, you need to tell more stories about a building than just its um, art historical values. I mean, it has a historic, in, in most of the cases, it has a, um, a couple of other values that makes it uh, preservable, but I, I, I really like to kind of try to um, promote that, that we should change the perspective from this kind of um, preservation says that this is uh, of a certain value, but try to kind of completely change it and to establish um, uh, the, the need for preserving buildings uh, already in the architecture schools. And so, I mean, um, there's so many architects, they really kind of, they, 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 they wait until the preservation department says, okay, now it's protected. You need to do now, you need to act now. Um, but what we, what we need to have is a culture of kind of um, taking, taking the built heritage um, as, a, as, a, as a resource um, without that it's protected or not. I mean, we, uh, there are really, there's some rare examples of, of clients that say, okay, we, we keep, our buildings in a in a perfect shape um, without um, this kind of strong um, the, 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 the strong um, 
uh, preservation uh, departments that, that say you must uh, you must act. And so I, I would I would say we, we need to have a culture that the, the the architectural culture itself, the culture of design, completely changes, and 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 um, and then it could go hand in hand with the with the preservation, but. Uh, um, my point of view, it's 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 also too. To, we 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 tend to wait until someone says you must act, uh, and and so um, architects should should start acting uh, by themselves. Do you mean acting to reimagine it? Yeah, to Is yeah, acting acting to 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 preserve something uh, without without a protection status. Yeah, right. Without having this kind of like a very official listing of yeah. protection. Definitely, right. definitely, yeah. Right. Yes. So yeah. So yeah, I, I thank you for the, that, those kind of responses. I have another question and it's really more about this sense of like, I, I couldn't help but remember the example that you gave uh, uh, Oliver, which is the, the Allen, Allen, the, the building in Allen, Allen, right? And then you yep. were comparing it to the Tange Kaga Kagawa's uh, uh, building as a way of advocating kind of like, hey, your building is of significance because it has this relationship or resonance with something else in other part of the world. So this is almost like a connection that you make with the international discourse, which, which is why SOS virtualism was so effective because it kind of raises what is seemingly local or unknown, let's say a building in Hong Kong, to something that is like much a greater, wider phenomenon. Um, so I just wanted, but at the same time, again, Johannes, your presentation is always full of counterpoints. And the counterpoint that you provided was almost this kind of like, let's look at really what matters to us, right? Don't really, don't really, we don't really need any reference to outside. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what you're engaging with, whether it's the 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 mechanism of Dokomomo or the mode of uh, the mode of, of communicating through Dokomomo or ICOMS, uh, ICOMOS, I guess. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts uh, about this whole this being is it the idea of it being a very kind of local, regional kind of activism and that's sufficient. Or should it really be part of a wider discourse for it to really gain a kind of a drive or significance even? So just wanted to hear that that kind of a... Well, maybe we come yeah. from a very uh, Asian Buddhist kind of perspectives that everything changes. And um, if, um, you know, it, it's not based on the materiality. So I think our, our thing is more on the functionality and also the usefulness and the meaning for our life. So if the, the physical form is gone, then it's gone. So we can, well, if you look into the, the traditional way, we are looking into after the, the, the disaster, for example, the tsunami, uh, all destroyed. Uh, the most important thing after the tsunami or earthquake or like in Japan, like Fukushima, is to, to build life. So human life is most, more important. While the buildings can be anything. You know, if a Chinese temple, uh, after a few years, uh, after one generation, it's, it's imperative for the, the population to, to rebuild a bigger one, to extend the bigger one, because uh, you have uh, money, you have you to show respect to the gods. So it's, it's more like dynamic, you see. And modernism, uh, the modernist building, uh, provide us with very interesting possibility because it's a frame. It's just a frame. So it's very easy to reprogram, very easy to reuse, very easy to, to change, to add. You know? It's not like, say, like classical buildings. So that's why modernism is very relevant to, to the changing, uh, the fast changing uh, situation, especially in, in Asia. And also we are talking about the, the layering process about these uh, different possibilities. Uh, so yes, uh, we are not really fixed, uh, doesn't want to, to, to iconize things. So that's why we put the M, the small M, and we insist that the A also small A. It's not the capital A or capital M. Of course, we can have one or two, but that is enough. If it's gone, gone, that's fine. Then how do you, how do you account for the kind of, uh, you know, a lot of people supporting like the, the preservation of a golden mile, for example, because it is back to the iconic that is being kept, right? The building does matter. It needs to be there. Yes. Yeah, but not all, right? So we have two at least. Uh, well, it's because of typology. Uh, we have a unique typology of golden mile because it's, it's, it's funny. You know? We have uh, People's Park Complex. This is also under threat now, but we don't know what will happen. 
we have like the the different types that we, we can say for the sake of academic uh, say like exercise it's good to have a physical form but if it's gone then we can have a full drawings and and whatever documentations to help us to understand the the concepts hmm. but it's Thank not a, a holy grail you know got it got it thank you well shayari just message and she wants to have some thoughts about this <laughs> please shayari Thanks. Um, no, I, I just think that there's um, so much to be gained in establishing these affinities and um, relationships that, you know, it might not always be a one to one model. And I think um, Johannes used some really amazing terms for talking about architecture, modern architecture in the tropical diaspora or the tropical belt. And I think in Sri Lanka, when, or with, with Jeffrey Bauer's practice, um, there is this bizarre thing where he's deemed to be the father of tropical modernism, even though he never used that word. Um, and what it does, I think, is it really others him. It's not modernism, it's this other thing. Um, and I think when those, t I think speaking about modernisms and modernities is so much more productive because you are able to establish relationships across geographies, across um, decades, and I think in Sri Lanka what has also happened is because for some reason that um, I guess it's a very evocative term the thought of tropical modernism has caught on so much then other very important modernist architects and there are many others we met the Silva, Valentine Gunasekara, um, Pani Penacon. Um, so these names where uh, I think their work actually more readily um, could be read as what, what we perhaps understand um, as modernism but because there's such an attraction for the tropicalized version of it, then actually the modern architecture does, or does not, this other architecture does not get um, preserved or get the same attention. And Sri Lanka becomes known for something that is so specific and so narrowly categorized. And I think um, what has been really refreshing about these conversations are that they've actually taken a step back and they've had a much broader outlook. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that to the mix. Thank you. Oliver, do you have any thoughts on, you know, I guess, I'm sure the intention behind your project is really having this discourse. No, no this is this is highly interesting. Uh, I think if we should kind of have a, a wide envelope with all the kind of different types of buildings in a certain period of time fits into it. Um, and at the same moment, I would say that um, this kind of buzzword uh, activism and this kind of tiny envelope like brutalism, um, it works quite well because it's a, it's a provocation also. And, and I mean, of course, when you look at, uh, at, at brutalist buildings, you see that there are so many different ways and forms that already in the 50s, there was this kind of, is there any brick brut brutalism or not? Could it be, I mean, uh, uh, Peter Smithson once said, brutalism could be made of gold. I mean, it's not, it's not limited to concrete at all. It could be a gold brutalism because it's the way you, you, you use gold in a, in a kind of, um, in its very natural way or so. Um, but, I, I, and, and I would say in, in, in this kind of late, late modern times, there are so many, it's, 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 it's always, it was always my idea not to make, um, a sharp division between brutalism and postmodernism, for instance, because when when you see all these temple type buildings, like like the one in Kaohsiung, Taiwan, or the the Boston City Hall, it's I mean it's it's already the longing for history uh, that that they architect that, that these architects are, and and so you can say, okay, why should we any longer stick to the term of brutalism? Why shouldn't we say it's all modernism, it's all modernity, different kinds of modernity? But on the other side, I, I think mm -hmm. the um, the kind of uh, call for action always works better in in if you have this kind of more or less smart use of buzzwords like brutalism. I mean, it's it it it, it works as a as a keyword, and everyone has something in mind which is is in a, in a broader and more accurate uh, way to describe uh, as modernity. You would not have, and so mm -hmm. I think. It's, 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 it has really this kind of campaign quality and the campaign quality is another quality than the historical um, mm. accuracy. All right. And in fact, I guess your example of the Kaohsiung building is, is really to show the importance of really broadening this envelope, right? Or even just this broad reference across geographies because it starts to question 
the the supposedly narrow definition of a term or you know or a criteria what we think is brutalism itself you know so the, the different forces that are behind it how it changes over time in different places so i think then yeah so it's almost like the need for that discourse right in order for us to reinvestigate or rethink what that term means so so that's that's why it is important i guess to go wide in that sense yeah momo christoph any thoughts about this whole local regional global kind of relationship and um in assessing i guess um architectural heritage in your in your i guess in where you are yes um uh, for the architectural heritage that um, of course we can divide it according to the time that uh, they they are popular and they were built and then they were used so for example like colonial architectural heritage but uh, when they were built and used by actual colonial administration, but actually the extent of use is it's uh, after colonial rule, it's, it's even a longer uh, and a more involved with the, the, the people of Myanmar associated with these buildings are longer than actual those who built uh, the, the client or the, the primary user at that time. So the, um, the architecture typology or the, the, the categories of heritage may differ, but uh, the, I mean, that's why we talk about urban conservation. So how these cities use that uh, built surrounding and how they are um, uh, choosing how they are associated with these buildings in, um, in, the, in the past or in recent history or so that that is um, more important. So uh, I mean as a heritage conservation uh, trust, we are more on the, 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 the significance in terms of historically or socially uh, rather than that uh, what what that is all in the architectural theory or the category. Uh, so I, I think that that is, uh, then that will be, that will be impact on the, how we're going to invest in um, saving this structure. So the who, who, what, what is more to be prioritized in the, yeah. Um, I, I agree that um, to advocate for the uh, preservation of buildings and um, it is ne sometimes necessary to be um, to, uh, to use terms like brutalism and, and such which um, also sell well in, in public um, and this is, is very helpful um, to, to gain the attention of the, of the wider public, since um, I'm, I'm convinced that um, uh, what we do as, as preservation office is the task we did, uh, we were given by the wider public. So we also have to communicate with the, with the wider public and they, uh, and then we, we need to use um, a language which is applicable for a, a wider understanding, for a wider attraction. Um, and, and this might not be the, the academic language we, we um, use in, uh, between ourselves. Um, but I also do see um, uh, one, one danger, especially in, in, in regards to, for example, the brutalist buildings, um, that we um, make them kind of more iconic than they are. Uh, uh, the Mäusebunker, the example I, I showed last, is, is a very good example. Um, it's, it's such an um, iconic building, a, a label, that um, it's, it's now in, F, uh, in, it's very easy to get it into the newspaper on the front page because they love this image of this sh uh, ship or, or whatever it is. Um, it's in music videos, it's in advertis advertisement right now, but everyone just stands in front of this building and uses it as, as a background. Basically, they, no one really talks about the 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 the, the further values and the, the 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 actual history of the building. It, it starts to become an image somehow, and um, 
and this is something I, I do not want to do. I just I, I'm 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 not there just to preserve images, uh, but I'm, I'm there to to preserve the full entity uh, in the end. And um, I think this is the, the 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 danger, and that's why we also, for example, included all those images from the inside, the plans, etc. The, the documents on the history in in the project because we we wanted to. Um, educate about the, the, the entire building and um, that's part of, of the, the discussion we, we have mm -hmm. between ourselves. How iconic do we make a building to, to be able to save it, basically? Yeah, thank you. We have about 11 minutes to the end of this session. I, I just have one question that is a little bit more practical, I guess, no, not practical, but I mean, like, uh, Christoph, you just ended with the idea of uh, what what it means to really be able to preserve the full entity or even communicate the full entity of a building. And um, and, and you mentioned about, you know, I guess you can use the edu education or the whatever that you have to communicate. So, so far, everybody had talked about the dissemination strategy, right? Whether it's all the workshops that, uh, that you know, that Masiana did uh, from the very beginning or, uh, yeah. So I just wanted to hear, you know, what do you think have been the least effective or the most, and the most effective kind of like dissemination strategy and why? of all the work that you've been doing. Just curious about this activism um, kind of tools, yeah. Least effective and the most kind of powerful that you didn't, that you felt like, okay, this is, it has to go this way. You gotta have the hashtag maybe, but I'm curious. Well, in reality, I, I always say that, that, that money stopped. So uh, the most effective way is engagement is really talking about this, uh, the environmental benefits uh, and also the, the, the guilt, sense of guilt. If you are trying to, to demolish a building, think again, how much carbon, uh, embedded carbon that you wasted and all that thing. And so it is kind of more rationalistic uh, thinking. But also, I think in looking into the, the condition after the, the COVID, uh, maybe only 50% people will return to the work. So maybe 50% of the office space will be empty. And uh, the economic model has changed. So most people are just doing online. So the big department stores and, and a shopping mall is all gone, right? So we have a, a lot of uh, empty spaces. Uh, and it does, and, and money is all spent for, for, for COVID, for, for fighting the disease. So that's why uh, we have to become very prudent. So I think it's, it's a time, actually, it's a, a good time to, to promote the, 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 or not just to promote, but also to push the, the directions of conserve, conserving this, especially the large uh, the building structure, uh, steel, concrete, whatsoever, and talking about adaptive reuse. And this is um, a, a, a practical and rational approach, right? So, well, the, the aesthetic, whatever, can, can go later, right? So it's, it's just a matter of uh, fun, right? Having fun. But in reality, I think money is top. Yes, if we may have each of you guys to share something, <laughs> and then we can wrap. Thanks, Iman. Very brutal honesty there. Yes. Brutal reality. <laughs> um, I think the, the most important the, the most important is that we have a, a very, very sound knowledge basis for, for every communication strategy. Um, um, and uh, that's what then makes it worthwhile also to, to do the dissemination. Uh, I can say that we have had a very um, positive experiences with YouTube videos, um, since they are kind of the, the tool of the time at the moment to, to, to watch from home about architecture. Um, what uh, used to be a, a tool um, where letters written by important people to other important people, uh, something like this um, works less and less as my, my experience. So um, being um, having something in the internet all the time uh, available is much more stronger than something written nowadays um, and and uh, that's how we also adjust our communication uh, at the moment. Thank you, Christoph. Oliver? 
Uh, yeah, well, um, no, it's funny be, funny that you just mentioned the letters because we, we more than once had the, um, we were asked uh, if we as a museum could write a letter to a mayor or to kind of other public, um, uh, public person. And, uh, and it's so unusual that museums do this. And when we did it, 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 it always caused quite a stir. And, and so the, the press was, was reporting about it. And, and I have to kind of defend it in the museum where I am writing letters uh, to, to some mayors in Germany and so. And that was, it was really funny because it works in a, in, 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 in a, in a way more than it, uh, I ever expected it. Um, but, uh, but generally, I mean, it's, it's a special case with this kind of writing of letters. Um, and in general, I would say that it's it's not so. Um, it, you really should 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 see if there is um, another uh, reservoir of 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 people that that are interested in a certain direction you can connect to. I mean, um, the, the the brutalism project would never have happened to be so successful, to say. Um, when there was not before already a kind of thousands of people uh, in, in on Facebook in a brutalism appreciation society and and so and so we we should we, we could connect to them and and so that was basically the idea that you you kind of you you be you, you have to be aware of the of of some uh, energies and where the energies go and and so it's not um, yeah and and that is that is that is really important to connect to to others that are already uh, engaged in the various fields, I would say. Momo? Yes, um, I think it's, uh, engagement is important. Uh, so different engagement to the different stakeholders. Uh, for example, as Olivia say that um, government engagement or the, the business community, but the fastest one is with the public through media. And um, uh, having relate them with the public spaces and make an event for the, especially the younger generation, so that uh, they become more attached to the city spaces, or the they have more enjoying with uh, their own identity and the proud of mm -hmm. the the city uniqueness or that kind of thing through media, the event, or the, I mean, different kinds of media, social media is very effective, and uh, more engaging with uh, the, the targeted group, and uh, when that uh, young generation is more engaged and the appreciative, then, then that is more effective, because they can influence on the general public, um, or the, even the decision um, making levels or the city authorities. Uh, I, think, I think that that is important. Thank, Thank you. you. Shayari, I know, you're, I, know, I know what Bawa Trust is doing is really more than just Bawa's work, but really the wider kind of uh, idea of art and design and architecture. So what do you think have been your kind of most effective strategy of relating or communicating a value or approach? I think effective has been, um, I mean, so the, the trust is privately owned, but we are for the public. And so by using these strategies to preserve these buildings, they've actually been, we've managed to actually enter them into the public realm. So you can visit them, you can do tours. I think Christoph mentioned the importance of, you know, it's not just about the building, but then having that engagement in terms of exhibitions, talks and tours. We've also found um, YouTube and social media to be incredibly important in just bringing a wide audience to experience and appreciate these buildings. So I think what was, you know, the, the, the first step of um, deconstructing, relocating, and then occupying this building was almost like a light, like the ICU method of conservation. But then it's once it's there, how do you sustain that use and how do you widen it? Um, I think less effective, unfortunately, has been that, you know, it's been a sort of um, very granular approach, building by building, and we haven't been able to really create um, a systemic difference and in Sri Lanka for a building to have architectural value it's actually still classified as archaeological value and it has to be built before 1815 
So this is still a completely colonial law. Um, between 1815 and 1915, if, if like a very famous person lived in it, you could potentially apply for archaeological value. But that's, um, I think, from that kind of policy level, we've been very, very unsuccessful. And I, I think it's also South Asia has perhaps been, um, I, I, I don't think, as successful as a region in creating that kind of... Um, overall um, change that I think is what we really need so that people like Minette's buildings and Valentine's buildings are also preserved, uh, which is totally what the Trust would love to do. Um, and hopefully, hopefully though, the, the idea is that as we start exhibiting these works and we are we're doing these programs to kind of create that general awareness so that we also then do create communities that protect. I mean, the Ina de Silva House, one of the reasons it was saved was because there was wide protest, um, because it was such an iconic project. Um, but I think the idea is to show more of these stories and more of these spaces. Thank you. Uh, I, I would... Wawa, can I say something a bit? Because I just yeah. remember that around 12 years ago or 10 years ago, when uh, uh, David Robson is still with us at NUS, Actually, we are doing an unbuilt Bawa project. So all the summer driving, especially the related to Singapore, like the botanical garden, the pyramid, we, we build it using a virtual reality. And it's, it's become extremely popular because uh, it's, the exhibition is, is attracting a lot of attention because of not just the name of Bawa, but something that is unbuilt. Mm -hmm. And it is the and, and David, uh, David Robson collected all these drawings. And then we, we, we also featuring some of the villa in Bali, uh, some houses and buildings. So by uh, focusing more on the concepts and the ideas, it's is, is also become quite uh, attractive for the, for the students and, and general public. Okay. Wonderful response, Johannes. I was about to direct you to address uh, Shayari's uh, woes, <laughs> but great, great, yes. But thank you all. I mean, I, I will just, I just want to say thank you really for all these uh, responses so far. And I'll just let Edward have the final word of saying goodbye. <laughs> can, can I, <laughs> Edward? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your input. And I think it was really great to hear all these different aspects. And which shows that uh, we can quite learn from each other also in how to deal with this modern heritage and not only how to preserve it, but also how to define it. I mean, there are so many aspects which previously have been uh, defined by a Western discourse, which now can be enriched by a more global discourse, which brings in a completely different mindset. And I think this is very important and also could change our own approach to the heritage uh, we have. And I think therefore it's very important. And so I thank you very much for um, being here and uh, Shirley for moderating this uh, discourse this afternoon. And of course, uh, stay tuned, uh, please, uh, you can follow us on social media, you can visit our website, and if you have the chance to come to Berlin before October 24th, you can see the exhibition uh, Contested Modernity in the Haus der Statistik uh, in Berlin, Alexanderplatz. So, of course, if you will come, please uh, let us know so we can give you a tour uh, to the exhibition. Thank you very much. We have, we do have one um, uh, symposium left, which will come in November, and we will communicate uh, the details later. Thank you. And Thank you so much. Good night and good uh, rest of the day to all. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you.